हे हाई गाइज दिस इज सी अर्पिता तुलसियान योर आई होप यू ऑल आर डूइंग गुड येस सो योर आई एम विद द सुपर क्विक रिविजन वीडियो फॉर पेपर फोर इकोनॉमिक लॉज एंड सिक्योरिटीज लॉ फॉर द मे ट्वेंटी थ्री एग्जामिनेशन एंड ऑनवर्ड्स सो यर वी आर गोइंग टू रिवाइज ईच एंड एवरी चैप्टर फ्रॉम एग्जाम पॉइंट ऑफ व्यू येस एंड इट इज गोइंग टू बी सुपर क्विक assuming you have uh, done it and now you are referring this particular video for your final revision yes this has been taken up from the 10th edition book uh, which is applicable for the may 23 examinations uh, in case uh, you have the book well and good if you need the book then the book is available on our website that is arpitatulsian.com we have uh, will try will try to cover maximum things in this particular video in the least possible time and uh, time stamps etc uh, when i'll be uploading it on youtube in the description section the time stamps etc will also be available with you so that it becomes very easy for you to locate a particular chapters video and uh, yes so i think we are all good to go for uh, starting this particular revision revise the entire syllabus cover maximum things possible for your examination uh make sure that you do writing practice of a few answers so that you have a good grip uh, while presenting an answer in the exam make sure that you solve the entire paper try to cover maximum syllabus uh, while your uh, studies during your reading time and i hope uh, this video is going to be helpful for you i wish you all the very best for your examinations you can continue watching this particular video and uh, do let me know in the comment section uh, if this video was helpful for you i love reading your comments and thank you so much for showering your love on me since long thank you so much okay so let's start with the super quick revision of the uh, chapter that is prevention of money laundering act 2002 let's start with it we will try to cover the most important things and maximum things in the least possible time let's start with it the first thing is the meaning of the term called as money laundering or what is the purpose of this particular act that is money laundering so money laundering is where we are trying to uh, hide the actual source of income that is the money which has been earned from illegal sources uh, we try to portray we try to show as if that money has been earned from uh, legal sources Uh, that is the meaning of money laundering and the purpose of this act is basically to stop these type of activities to prevent money laundering to provide suppose if we have acquired any asset out of this money laundering then to confiscate the assets which have been acquired out of money laundering and to reduce or uh, reduce the activity where the money goes into illegal activities or the money is earned out of illegal activities we are trying to reduce those type of activities okay so this is the meaning of the term called as money laundering basic meaning uh, this is not the definitional meaning of money laundering basic meaning and the purpose of this particular act that is uh, prevention of money laundering Yeah, and yes the notes that you can see here on the board these are from your 10th edition of law book which is available on our website arpitatulsian.com which is specifically applicable for your may 2023 examinations yes let's continue ahead so now the next thing that we have to do here is money laundering money laundering they say that it is a single process okay it is a single process with three stages three stages which you already know you can repeat with me first one is placement second one is layering and the third one is integration placement is such a thing where the criminal activity is done and the money is now put into the system okay after that layering this entire money which we have earned out of illegal sources this is divided into various transactions and it is divided over various accounts by which we uh, totally like uh, we totally forget from where the original money was actually earned from which source from which illegal source the money was actually derived that is totally gone because the money that we have earned from illegal sources is divided over through uh, various transactions and various accounts and therefore it becomes very difficult to detect the origin from where the money was actually earned and the last one is integration by doing this the money which was obtained out of illegal sources that gets uh, mixed with the money which was obtained out of legal sources it gets integrates and therefore now there is nothing called as money derived out of illegal activities 
right any basic example of money laundering basic example of money laundering can be uh, smuggling it can be theft it can be dealing into drugs it can be financial scams like stock market scams smuggling etc right these are your kidnapping uh, murders etc these are your basic uh, examples of money laundering yes okay then going ahead to the next part that is uh, some important definitions which have been given here in your book so the first definition that is given definitions are covered in section 2 that you already know so money laundering is covered in section 2 1p but then they say that the meaning of the term money laundering is given the definition of that is given in section number 3 this is one such definition that you have to remember which is called as offense of money laundering or we can say that who will be guilty of the offense of money laundering so if there is any particular person okay if there is any particular person who is involved in any such activity who is assisting any other person who is a party to such offense or who is actually involved in that particular offense which relates to proceeds of crime which relates to proceeds of crime where we are involved in concealment possession utilization acquisition of any particular of any particular property of any particular property which we are trying to project which we are trying to show as if it is an untainted property untainted property means as if it is a clean property we are trying to show then in such a case but actually that money was derived or actually that property was derived out of proceeds of crime so in that case we become guilty of the offense of money laundering clear with this yes okay and uh, we will be guilty that particular person will be guilty if that if that particular person is involved in concealing that proceeds of crime using that proceeds of crime having possession if any such person is having the possession of that proceeds of crime or if that person is trying to project it is trying to show it, they are trying to portray as if it is an untainted property then in such a case those people will be guilty of the offense of money laundering and till the time till the time see today suppose if some person has earned Earned that proceeds of crime today he is guilty and he will be guilty till the time he is ultimately enjoying the proceeds of crime till the time he is having that proceeds of crime with him till that particular time that person will be guilty of the offense of money yes so this definition definition of money laundering was given under section 21p but what was written in section 21p it was written that the definition of the term called as offense of money laundering is given in section number three Yes, and that's why whatever we studied that was coming from section number 3. Now, from this we get two very important terms. One is proceeds of crime and the other important term there is property. Now, what do you mean by the term proceeds of crime? Okay, what do you mean by the term proceeds of crime? Proceeds of crime means any property. Okay, see the words any property which is derived because of any criminal activity. See the name now proceeds of crime is what proceeds of crime means something some proceeds earned from criminal activity. So any property which is derived from your criminal activity. Okay ma'am what do you mean by criminal activity? Criminal activity is any such offense which is mentioned in the scheduled offense. Okay any such offense which is mentioned in the scheduled offense. If any property is derived from that then the value of that particular property uh, whether that property is in India or whether that property is outside India doesn't matter that value will be considered as your proceeds of crime okay so proceeds of crime is some amount which we have earned by doing some crime which is mentioned in scheduled offense so ma'am what do you mean by the term called as scheduled offense scheduled offense is nothing but a list of offenses which is given for your PMLA which is divided into three parts part A part B and part C part A contains uh, the list of the offenses if we have done any of those offenses we will be guilty of money laundering part B also contains some specified offenses but we will be guilty of the offense of money laundering only if the amount involved in that particular offense is more than or equal to rupees 1 crore or any such offenses which are given under part C. So for part A and part C there is no limit for part B there is a limit we will be guilty under PMLA only if the amount involved in the offenses more than or equal to rupees 1 crore. Very clear with this yes and for your information purpose at the end of your 10th edition book this uh, particular volume we have the list of the scheduled offenses also. Right. Another term that we saw in the definition of the term called as proceeds of crime was a term called as property. Remember any property that was derived out of any 
क्रिमिनल एक्टिविटी रिलेटेड टू शेड्यूल ऑफ सो मैम वट यू मीन बाय प्रॉपर्टी प्रॉपर्टी कैन बी एनी टाइप ऑफ एसेट एनी टाइप ऑफ एसेट इट कैन बी मूवेबल इट कैन बी इमूवेबल इट कैन बी टैंजिबल इट कैन बी इन टैंजिबल इट कैन बी सिचुएटेड योर इन इंडिया और इट कैन बी सिचुएटेड आउटसाइड इंडिया इट कैन बी मटीरियल मीन्स बिग अमाउंट और इट कैन बी इम मटीरियल ऑल्सो डजेंट मैटर एवरीथिंग विल बी इंक्लूडेड इन द टर्म कॉल्ड एज property so if i say jewelry if i say cash if i say land if i say any particular other type of asset everything will be included in the term called as property and if we have derived any property by doing any scheduled offense okay then we then that will be considered as proceeds of crime and if we have derived that proceeds of crime then we will be guilty of the offense of money laundering i hope i am very very clear till here yes okay then after that uh, going on to these are some important definitions which we can cover here in the super quick uh, lecture yes rest of the definitions are given in the book you can simply go through uh, them once then going on to the next section i'm going to the next section that is punishment for the offense of money laundering very important section as you can see here section number 4 see the reference of the question numbers which i have given uh, which shows that how important it is and how many times the question has been asked from them yes so now section number 4 any particular person who has done the offense of money laundering ma'am offense of money laundering where was it given offense of money laundering was given in section number 3 so if there is any person who is found guilty of the offense of money laundering then that person will be liable for some punishment because he has done this grave offense so he will be liable for a rigorous imprisonment of minimum 3 years which can go up to 7 years so imprisonment 3 years to 7 years and and fine of any amount this is the punishment which will be given for any particular person who is involved in the offense of money laundering but if a particular person is specifically held liable under an act called as narcotic drugs and psychotropic substances act 1985 name to be remembered narcotic drugs and psychotropic substances act 1985 then means he has done a even more graver offense in such a case that person will be liable for imprisonment minimum 3 years but which can go up to 10 years earlier it was 3 like for the other offenses it was 3 to 7 here it is 3 to 10 and fine of any amount i hope i am very very clear with this yes okay so this was your section number 4 where they had specified the punishment for the offense of money laundering very clear with this yes now going on to the next section that is section number 11a now comes uh, some uh, simple part a uh, simple things and some procedural things now what they are trying to tell us here is see whenever we are earning any amount any illegal money i can say and we are trying to convert it like what we say in your own terms is black money into white money or any illegally obtained money when we try to convert it into legal sources then one intermediary is always involved knowingly or unknowingly and that is your banks right whenever say for example if we have earned some illegal money and we want to convert into white every month say for example we deposit 5 5000 rupees into our bank no one asks us that from where did you earn this 5000 rupees right so uh, in these case banks etc are also unknowingly knowingly or unknowingly even the banks are involved in this so what has the pmla done is pmla has put some procedures even for the reporting entity that you have to be careful you have to be careful whenever the client is doing the transactions with you these banks financial institutions etc are cumulatively called as the reporting entity in this particular act right now listen uh, what what is the first thing which has been told to this reporting entities whenever a client comes to you whenever a customer comes to you make sure that you first verify their identity okay that you first verify the identity of the uh, uh, of the clients who are coming to you so ma'am now how do we verify the identity of the clients etc there are four ways of identity verification first one is Online authentication under the Aadhaar Act. Example, Aadhaar-based OTP. You must have heard and used. Okay. Next one is offline verification under Aadhaar, where we submit the photocopy of the Aadhaar, etc. Next one is your uh, verification using passport, and the last one is verification using any other officially valid document as notified by the central. government any of these methods can be used by the reporting entity for the identity verification you must have heard about the term called as kyc so this is something like that only
I hope I am very very clear with this. So these are the four modes of verification which every reporting entity has to follow mandatorily whenever they are doing any sorts of transaction with their clients. Yes. Then come to the next section that is section number 12. Section number 12 talks about obligations of the reporting entity. What are the uh, obligations of the reporting entity which it has to do mandatorily as per PMLA. See other acts can also be applicable to the reporting entity example banking regulation act can be applicable RBI act can be applicable except companies act can be applicable to the reporting entities but whatever we are studying in this particular chapter these are the requirements which have been put forward by the PMLA 2002 right. So now there are three most important obligations which have to be followed and fulfilled by every reporting entity. Okay, what are those three obligations? Let's try to understand. What are the three duties of the reporting entity? First one, first one, it has to maintain record of all the transactions as given in rule number three. In your book, immediately after this, I have given rule number three. So, uh, Every reporting entity has to maintain record of all the transactions as mentioned in rule number 3 for a period of 5 years. Okay, for a period of 5 years from the date of transaction. Means whenever there is a transaction between the client and the reporting entity, uh, record of all those important big value transactions as specified in rule number 3, those transaction details have to be maintained by every reporting entity for a period of 5 years from the date of transaction. Second one is when whenever the reporting entity is now maintaining the record of those transactions, whenever the PMLA authority that is director under PMLA, not the company's director, director under PMLA, whenever he comes and asks for certain information, the reporting entity will have to furnish that information to the director. Director is nothing but your government official under PMLA. Okay, within some prescribed time, it has to furnish. In the first point, it was maintaining the record of transaction. In the second point, it has to furnish the information to the director. And the last one is again, maintaining record of documents. Above it was maintaining record of all the transactions. Here it is maintaining record of all the documents for a period of 5 years, whatever documents are exchanged between the client and the reporting entity, details of that has to be maintained by every reporting entity for a period of 5 years after the business transaction, a uh, business relationship between the client and the reporting entity has ended or the account has been closed, whichever is later. Means all the time when the account is opened from the... Uh, for that particular time, it has to maintain the record of all the documents. Even once the account has been closed, even after that for a period of 5 years, it has to maintain the record of all these documents. I hope I am very very clear with this everyone. Yes, so first point maintain record of all the transactions for a period of 5 years. Next point furnish that information to the director and the third one is maintain record of all the documents for a period of 5 years after the business relationship has ended or account has been closed whichever is late. Very clear with this? Okay. Uh, and which rec the transaction details that we were maintaining that the reporting entity was maintaining that was not for all the transaction. It is for all the transactions as specified as specified under rule number 3. Rule number 3 gives the gives certain category of transactions for which the details has to be maintained by every reporting entity. I hope I am very very clear till your everyone. Yes. Okay. Then going on to the next section that is section number 12 A. Okay. 12 A talks about enhanced due diligence. Now every reporting entity was supposed to uh, comply with the obligations as given under section number 12. Before that, it was required to do the identification uh, of the clients, uh, uh, identification of the clients that we had done under section 11a that was done by four methods. Remember, online authentication under other, offline authentication under other, passports and any other officially valid document of the central government. First, ID verification was done, then obligations was fulfilled under section number 12. Now, they are giving us some more points for some more important transactions. That is section number 12 A. Okay, 12 A talks about enhanced due diligence. Enhanced due diligence, more care is to be taken while doing big value transactions by the reporting 
entity so whenever whenever the client wants to enter into some specific transactions not for all the transaction for some specific transaction reporting entity has to first verify the id of the clients verify the identity of the clients right same uh, of aadhar passport or any other other document then it will even take additional steps to examine the ownership and financial position is the client even capable of does he even have that financials in his balance sheet to do such type of transactions such high value transactions and then the reporting entity will try to find out the purpose why is the client entering into such high value transactions so basically the bank is kind of not exactly but kind of doing scrutiny or try, kind of doing audit why the client wants to enter into some high value specified transactions if bank gets good answers supporting answers for every question that has been asked then the bank will allow the client to do that transaction but if the client fails to fulfill the above requirements means the client is not able to answer the bank then in such case and if the bank is of or uh, reporting entities of the opinion know that this transaction can be a suspicious transaction this can lead to money laundering etc then the bank or the reporting entity will do further monitoring it will do further checks into the uh, clients books of accounts etc and if later on if it is of the opinion that okay we should allow the client to do the transaction then the reporting entity will allow the client to do the transaction but if the reporting entity even after further scrutiny if it is of the opinion that no no the this may lead to money laundering etc then the reporting entity may even deny okay the reporting entity may even deny the client to uh, undertake that particular transaction okay but this is again not for day to day transaction which a client enters into this section entire section of enhanced due diligence deep checking we can say this is applicable only for specified transaction maybe the transaction which has high value or the transaction which involves forex or the transaction which has high value of imports or exports or the transaction which has high risk of money laundering terrorism terrorist funding activities and all those things only for those uh, transactions the section 12a is applicable i hope i am very very clear with this everyone yes okay going ahead with the next section that is section number 13 section number 13 talks about powers of directors okay remember we had just seen this word called as directors director here is the government official to whom we were furnishing the information under that obligation section so what power that particular person has he is basically a pmla authority right so what powers does that, does that person has this particular director this particular director has the power to do enquiries okay he can do enquiry into the books of accounts of the reporting entity he can get a special audit done apart from your normal statutory audits he can even get a special audit done by a chartered accountant and the audit expenses of this thing will be borne by the central government and then if uh, if the director of the of uh, this pmla authority if it is of the opinion that the obligations are not complied by the reporting entity etc then it can even issue warnings to the reporting entity it can tell them please comply with the instructions it can tell them to do periodic reporting so that we can have a watch on them and if if suppose they are still not complying with any of the obligations or directions given by the director then penalty can be imposed which may range between rupees 10000 to 1 lakh for each failure this is whose powers this is the power of the director ma'am who is this director director is nothing but the government official under pml very very clear with this yes this is this is nothing but the powers of the director so what we have seen till now was initially we had seen the definition part then we saw the punishment for money laundering which was given in section number 4 then we checked the uh, identity very we verified the identity of the clients that uh, that we did under section 11a by four methods then we went to obligations of the reporting entity which was there in section number 12 uh three obligations of the reporting entity we had done then we saw enhanced due diligence under section 12 aa enhanced due diligence for some specified transactions 
uh, and then we saw powers of the director under section number 13 right now going on to the next part of the chapter that is your attachment adjudication and confiscation this is another big part and another important part of your chapter now let's try to understand this what is going to be there in this attachment adjudication and confiscation let's start with it can we start everyone yes so attachment adjudication and confiscation now uh, see if there is any particular person who is involved in the offense of money laundering we had seen one thing is that that particular person will be liable for punishment under section number 4 right that is okay he was liable for punishment but what if that person has acquired some property by doing the offense of money laundering someone kidnapped me and he got jewelry in return from some ex person for kidnapping me then what about that jewelry that jewelry should be confiscated right he should not be enjoying that jewelry which he has obtained out of the offense of money laundering so now what to, to that particular person we gave punishment under section number four that we gave to that particular person but what about the property what about the property that was involved in money laundering so can we say that that even that property should be confiscated right so now in that it can involve three stages first one is provisional attachment second one is attachment and the third one is confiscation right so now first let's talk about provisional attachment okay first let's talk about provisional attachment provisional attachment is such a thing provisional attachment is such a thing where that director okay the director under pmla which we were talking about the director or any officer but not below the rank of deputy director we have different varieties or different levels of directors here so director or any other officer not below the rank of deputy director if that person if that person has reasons to believe uh, in writing then the, if that person is of the opinion that some person is having the possession of proceeds of crime and that person is trying to conceal it that person is may transfer that proceeds of crime or that person may deal in that proceeds of crime then such director or any officer not below the rank of deputy director such person may provisionally attach such person may provisionally attach uh, the proceeds of crime we i did not use the word attach i use the word provisionally attached the proceeds of very clear with this yes now listen now listen now who did this uh, provisional attachment provisional attachment was done by the director or uh, any officer not below the rank of deputy director very clear with this right now uh, one important uh, thing that he has to do before he does the provisional attachment is before he does provisional attachment he has to prepare a report that he is of the opinion that such a, so and so person is having the proceeds of crime and that report will be forwarded to the magistrate this is just like filing a complaint with the magistrate and then only that person can go for provisional attachment but if in some emergency case we do not have time to go to the magistrate to file the complaint then in such cases we can first do the provisional attachment and then we can go and uh, file the uh, uh, report or the complaint to the magistrate and once a provisional attachment is done say for example provisional att attachment happened today then the validity of the provisional attachment is going to be for a period of 180 days from the date of provisional attachment and if during these provisional attachment during these 180 days suppose if there was any stay order which has been passed by the high court then we are going to get some extra period that is the stay period plus ad hoc period of 30 days right this is the extra time period which we are going to get because of the stay order very clear with this so as soon as the provisional attachment is done provisional attachment is going to be valid for a period of 180 days and as soon as the provisional attachment is done from that day within a time period of 30 days the director will go and inform to the next level of authority that is the adjudicating authority that sir i have done provisional attachment because i am of the opinion that there is a case of money laundering here okay so this was done by the director valid for a period of 180 days as soon as the provisional attachment is done within 30 days we will go and file a complaint with the adjudicating authority that sir there is a case of money laundering and now you can take the case ahead 
okay and yes during this provisional attachment we can still use the property we cannot transfer we cannot deal in the property but we can still use the property very very clear with this yes okay so now provisional attachment after provisional attachment comes the next thing that is the final attachment or we can say adjudication final decision making provision attachment was done by the director or any officer not below the rank of deputy director and the next thing next thing will be done by the adjudicating authority so as soon as the adjudicating authority receives the complaints from the director the adjudicating authority will issue a notice called as show cause notice adjudicating authority will issue a notice called as show cause notice for a period of 30 days that you have to tell me why we should not treat as if you are involved in the offense of money laundering and uh, tell us from where did you earn this asset how did you purchase this asset every every detail will be asked by the adjudicating authority to that particular accused person and to that he has to reply within a time period of 30 days okay now depending upon the reply depending upon the reply which is given by that accused person reply can be what reply can be a good reply a satisfactory reply then we can release that particular property if the reply is an unsatisfactory reply then the provisional attachment may get converted into attach very clear with this yes now suppose if suppose if the reply given by that accused person is a satisfactory reply then we will release then the property is free but if the reply is unsatisfactory reply or there is no reply from the accused person then we will pass the attachment order right attachment order is basically passed by whom then attachment order is passed by the adjudicating authority and it is going to have a validity of 365 days means as soon as the attachment order is passed it will be valid for a period of 365 days days and within these 365 days suppose if there is any stay order by the high court then we will get an extra period of stay suppose if the stay was for 45 days then we will get an extension of 45 days here there is no ad hoc period of 30 days that is available okay and during these 365 days the final confiscation order should be passed by the special court okay attachment order was passed by the adjudicating authority confiscation order is passed by the very clear with this and that has to be done within a time period of 365 days very very clear with this special court special court can pass an order that yes uh, this should be confiscated or special court can even pass an order that no no the uh, property is not involved in money laundering and therefore it is free even that such type of order can be passed so the final decision making authority here is the special court so I hope you are clear with the three authorities who were there in the chapter. First one was what? First one was your provisional attachment. Provisional attachment was done by whom? Provisional attachment was done by the director or any officer not below the rank of deputy director. Validity was 180 days plus stay period plus 30 days if there is any stay. Second level is your attachment. Attachment order is passed by the adjudicating authority and having a validity of 300 and 65 days and the last one is your confiscation order confiscation order was passed by the special i hope i'm very very clear with this yes okay then going on to the next one going on to the next one that is vesting of property now as soon as the property is confiscated confiscation order was passed by um, confiscation order was passed by the special code as soon as the property is confiscated the property belongs to whom now the property goes to the central government free from all the liabilities if there is any liability attached to that particular property that liability does not go to the central government only the asset goes to the central government very very clear with this yes so see the legal words that you have to use in the exam the all the title in such property shall vest in the central government which shall be free from all the encumbrances encumbrances means free from all the liabilities free from all the charges very clear with this okay now uh, the next thing that they tell us here is the adjudicating authority that was there in the chapter adjudicating authority who had come for the attachment part that has all the powers as vested in a civil court Okay, that is uh, discovery and inspection of books of accounts, enforcing attendance of any person, taking evidences on affidavits, issuing orders for summoning any person for examination of witness, etc. Whatever powers are there with the civil court, same to same powers are also there with the adjudicating authority. 
यस अच्छा नेक्स्ट सेक्शन सेक्शन नंबर नाइनटीन पावर टू अरेस्ट Now, as we try to link it with section number four, what was the punishment for the offence of money laundering under section number four? It was imprisonment and fine, right? Imprisonment three years to seven years, and in case of drugs, it was three years to ten years. So, can I say if we want to give imprisonment to any other any particular person, we have to first arrest that person. Yes. So, these director or deputy director, these people have the powers to go and arrest any particular person without an arrest warrant. Without an arrest warrant, just go to that particular person, inform him the reason why why are we arresting you? Arrest that particular person, and that person will be brought to the special court or judicial magistrate or metropolitan magistrate within twenty four hours of his arrest. Travelling time would be extra, obviously, but within twenty four hours, as soon as he is arrested, within twenty four hours, he should be presented before the special court or magistrate for further process. very clear with this but one thing that you have to remember here is for arrest under pmla arrest warrant is not required it is not mandatory we can go and arrest any particular person without an arrest warrant just inform him the reason why are we arresting him and that particular person can be arrested and then he will be presented before the jurisdictional special court or judicial magistrate or metropolitan magistrate very very clear with this Yes, okay. So till year, till year we are done with our uh, basic definitions part, punishment part, procedural part for reporting entity, and then the three important things that is provisional attachment, attachment, and confiscation. Very very clear with this. Yes. Now going on to the next part of the chapter that is your appeal provision. yes let's go to the appeal provisions everyone now we already know that whenever uh, any authorities come into picture and whenever there is any accused person who is coming into picture there can be a dispute between the two means the authorities would say that you are liable we would say that no we are not liable etc for that purpose for that purpose we have got the appeal provisions coming up here okay now pmla does not have its own appellate tribunal so we take the appellate tribunal from the smugglers and foreign exchange manipulators act okay appellate tribunal we we have got two levels of appeal first one is before the appellate tribunal next one is before the high court but pmla does not have its own appellate tribunal so we go and file our appeal cases before the appellate tribunal under smugglers and foreign exchange manipulators act okay so now uh, just try to understand here suppose if suppose if the director under money laundering or the agree the accused person if they are aggrieved by the order passed by adjudicating authority aggrieved by the order passed by adjudicating authority means the attachment order if any of them either the director is aggrieved or the accused person is aggrieved by that order or whenever the reporting entity is aggrieved by the order of the director reporting entity banks etc were aggrieved by the order passed by the director then only in such cases we can go and file an appeal before the appellate tribunal within a time period of 45 days from the date of receipt of the order if there is any sufficient reason then there can be an extension beyond 45 days also no problem in that and uh, appellate tribunal appellate tribunal will take the final decision it may confirm or, or modify or set aside the decision the order which was passed earlier yes and at will try to dispose of this appeal as soon as possible and will try to dispose of the appeal within a time period of 6 months from the date of filing the appeal so appeal can be filed within 45 days plus any period extension and appeal disposal should happen within a time period of so the final decision making authority here is the appellate tribunal and uh, if we are still aggrieved by the order passed by the appellate tribunal we can go for the final level of appeal that is before the high court that is before the high court within a time period of 60 days okay that is within a time period of 60 days and uh, th this time period can be further extended if there is any sufficient cause for another period of 60 days and the final decision making authority is going to be the high court here bus full and final after high court there is no possibility of going to the supreme court under pmn so only two levels of appeal one is the appellate tribunal and the next one is your high court 
very clear with this and this appellate tribunal just like your adjudicating authority it also has the same powers as vested in a civil court an appellate tribunal is basically it functions in form of a bench the decision is taken by the members of the bench a bench consists of generally two members and if there is a difference of opinion between these two members then they will refer the matter to the chairperson of the appellate tribunal but the basic funda is the decision should be taken by majority of the members of the appellate tribunal and if uh, we do not know how to represent the case before the appellate tribunal then we can appoint any person called as authorized representative who can go and appear before the appellate tribunal very very clear with this yes okay then the next court which is going to be there into the picture is your special court where have we seen the role of special court till now special court was coming into picture for passing the order of confiscation remember confiscation order was passed by the special court so what is the work of special court in this particular act one thing that we had already seen is special court's work is to pass the confiscation order and another thing whenever that person was arrested that person was presented before the special court within a time period of 24 hours so all the cases of pmla imprisonment fine cases etc all those cases will be tried will be solved by the special court okay so special court is not formed only for pmla purpose special court is formed for other laws also but for the purpose of pmla special court is going to handle the section 4 thing that is whenever the punishment under pmla is given the remember how much was the amount of fine given under section number 4 it was of any amount right so that will be determined by whom that will be determined by the special court similarly what was the range of imprisonment given there it was 3 years to 7 years or it was 3 years to 10 years so the final period final period of imprisonment will also be decided or it will also be determined by the special court very very clear with this okay then 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 going ahead uh yes the section number 45 as you can see here on the board can you see section number 45 here on the board mark section number 45 as very very important in your book also everyone can we go ahead okay section number 45 section number 45 Uh, offenses to be cognizable and non-bailable. Okay. Now, one thing that we had already seen there in section number nineteen, if I am not wrong, is arrest without warrant. Remember, I told you that uh, that uh, director, deputy director, or any CG officer can go and do the arrest, and for that purpose, arrest warrant is also not required, right? Arrest warrant is also not required. now there are two terms given here one is cognizable and the other one is non bailable cognizable means arrest without warrant okay see here it's written cognizable is nothing but arrest without warrant we already know that whenever arrest happens under pmla for that purpose arrest warrant is not required uh, and the next term given here is non bailable offense non bailable means what non bailable offense is whenever that person is arrested that person cannot be released on bail or bond he cannot be released on bail or bond okay this is the basic funda this is the basic condition given under section number 45 but that person can be released on bail or bond in some exceptional circumstances those exceptions we are going to study in section number 45 so the basic two things is all the offenses are cognizable means if that person is arrested under pmla he can be arrested without an arrest warrant and second one is all the offenses are non bailable non bailable means that person cannot be released on bail except under some special circumstances now ma'am what are those special circumstances where he can be released on bail so first one is uh, if suppose we uh, bring a public prosecutor and we take his uh, his uh, uh, what do you say opinion if public prosecutor uh, was involved and he has been given an opportunity to oppose the release and if he says that he, this person should not be if he says that this person should not be released on bail then we will not release that person on bail but if that person says that he should be released on bail if if public prosecutor says that okay release this person on bail then we can release that person on bail if he says that no you cannot release this person on bail 
but the special court is still of the opinion that this person may be released on bail and he will not commit any new offense while on bail then that person can be released means you are just giving an opportunity to the public prosecutor to listen to what he says but the final decision making will be done by whom final decision making will be done by the special court okay and in some cases if the special court is of the opinion that if, if that person is of less than 16 years of age, if that person is sick or infirm, if that person is accused of some involved of less than rupees 1 crore, if that person is a woman, then if the special court says so, then that person can be released on bail. Okay, Releasing on bail does not mean releasing permanently. It is just releasing temporary for a shorter period. I hope I am very very clear with this everyone. Yes, so only in such exceptional circumstances, first one where the public prosecutor was involved, then that person can be uh, released on bail or in such exceptional circumstances that person can be released on bail, otherwise the person cannot be released on bail under PM. Very, very clear with this, yes. <laughs> so till here, till here, a particular part of your chapter is done. Now going on to the last procedural part, penalties, punishments, etc. Those things are going to come into picture here. Now, while the offense of money laundering is happening, there is a high possibility that two countries or two or more countries are involved in the offense of money laundering. Whenever the other country, whenever the other country is involved, that other country is called as the contracting state. Okay, we will not call it as the other country. Other country, I am just telling you for our understanding, we are going to call that particular other country as contracting state for the purpose of this chapter. Okay. So, whenever generally what happens is India enters into a treaty or India enters into an agreement or the Indian central government, central government of India enters into an agreement with such other country. Okay. And that other country is called as what? That other country is called as contracting state with whom we enter into an agreement that uh, we will uh, enforce the provisions of PMLA in your country. Whenever any of our citizens does the offense of money laundering, we, you, we will share the information with you whenever required. You have to share the information with us whenever required and all those things. We will, you are, we will um, allow investigation of cases in the respective countries whenever required. So basically we are entering into a friendly agreement. We are entering into a friendly agreement with the other country that is the contracting state that whenever any cases of PMLA happens, then in that case we will be able to enforce the provisions of PMLA in the other country as well. Okay, but when will we uh, enforce these provisions? Only when there are any offenses of cross-border implications. Okay, whenever there are any offenses of cross-border implications. Ma'am, what do you mean by the term called as cross-border implication? Cross-border implication means where more than one country is involved. Example, example, whenever the offense has been done outside India. Example, kidnapping has been done outside India. And uh, the proceeds of crime has been transferred to India. Uh, the activity is done outside India. Money is brought into India. This is an offense of cross-border implication. Or vice versa. Where the offense has been done in India. And the proceeds of crime has been transferred outside India. Or we have tried to transfer the proceeds of crime outside India. Then in such cases, uh, the, these type of offenses will be called as cross-border implications where we will take the help of the other country or we, where we will take the help of the contracting state. Where we will take the help of the contracting state to, um, what, do, what do we say, uh, enforce the provisions of PMLA or it can also happen that other country can seek help from India and that is possible only because of this uh, agreement. Right. Achha. Now, whenever, whenever any such offenses of cross-border implication happens at that particular point of time, how do we share the information? There is a document called as letter of request. Okay, letter of request. Suppose if we want information from the other country, then we will issue the letter of request to the contracting state and then the contracting state will revert back on that particular letter. Vice versa, suppose if they need our help, then we will receive the letter of request from them and then we will share the information with the contracting state. I hope I am very very clear with this and similarly because of this uh, agreement, treaty with the other country, 
we will be able to do confiscation in the other country we will be able to do attachment of property in the other country confiscation of property from the other country the accused person who is trying to hide himself in the other country we will be able to bring back that person into india this is possible only because of this is possible only because of the treaty uh, which india has entered into with the other contracting state very very clear with this yes now a few uh, punishments which are given up here which uh, we'll do it once now one important punishment that we had already done that was under section number four that was for punishment for the offense of money laundering now we have to do punishments under two sections one is section number 62 and the other one is section number 63 Section number 62 talks about punishment for vexatious search. Whenever any authority under PMLA does search and seizure in our premises without the uh, reasons being recorded in writing, then in such case that officer will be liable for imprisonment which can go up to 2 years or fine up to 50,000 or both. Imprisonment or fine or both. Okay, imprisonment up to two years or fine up to fifty thousand or both. Who is liable for this punishment? This punishment is coming on the officer who did vexatious just for fun. He did some search without recording the reasons in writing. Okay, and similarly, suppose if someone gave false information about me, which led to search and seizure in my premises or which led to my arrest someone gave false information about me purposely then that person will also be liable for the same punishment that is imprisonment up to two years or fine up to fifty thousand or both very very clear with this yes and uh, uh, apart from that so this punishment is same huh? officer also was liable for the same punishment and the person who gave false information knowingly about me uh, for that person also the punishment is same and the second part now suppose if there is any particular person uh, who was required to furnish some information or if some person was required to sign any document and we refused to uh, sign the document or if uh, i was summoned but i did not present myself before the authorities then in such cases i will be liable for a penalty which can range between 500 to 10000 for each default 500 to 10000 for each default this is the penalty this is not the punishment this is the penalty which will be liable on the person who is not complying to the orders very very clear with this yes okay so these are these are your some uh, important uh, punishments penalties etc that we have done in the chapter here now uh, now whatever fine penalty etc has been imposed on us fine or penalty that has been imposed on us we have to make sure that we pay it within a time period of six months from the date of imposition. Six months from the date of imposition and if it is not paid then we can recover. Then the authorities basically can recover as per the income tax provisions. That is by attaching the bank account, selling movable or immobile properties etc. So basically we have to pay it within a time period of six months. Yes and the next thing, next thing here is offenses by the companies see we know that whenever we are held guilty under the offense of money laundering we will be liable for punishment right we will be liable for punishment that is uh, given under section number four fine and imprisonment okay apart from now suppose if the, uh, the offense of money laundering is done by an individual person then fine and imprisonment is okay but what if the offense of money laundering is done by a company then who will be liable there then the person in charge will be deemed to be guilty and he will be proceeded. Person in charge uh, can be any directors of the company, it can be managers of the company, it can be secretary of the company, any particular person who is considered as a person in charge of the affairs of the company at the time when the offense was done. But if that person proves that it happened without his knowledge, he had exercised all due diligence to prevent that offense and um, uh, all those things, then in that case, he will be excused and he will not be liable for the punishment okay so basically in case of companies etc the person in charge will be held guilty of the offense of money laundering very very clear with this and uh, what will happen suppose if the case of money laundering is going on maybe the case is under appeal etc and if that person passes away 
the accused person passes away then the case does not gets over the case continues against the legal representative of that particular person suppose accused person had filed an appeal before the appellate tribunal or before the high court and during those 45 days or 60 days that person passes away no problem the appeal will not lapse the appeal will be continued against the legal representative suppose if that person becomes insolvent then the appeal will be continued against the official assignee or the official receiver okay so in case of death it will continued it will be continued by the legal representative in case of insolvency it will be continued by the official assignee or the official receiver very very clear with this so in case of basically in case of death or insolvency the case will not get over the case will be continued I hope I am very very clear with this. Yes, so these were your important provisions. Okay, these were your important provisions under PMLA. The most important provisions uh, which is uh, relevant from your exam point of view also which you have to mandatorily cover before your exams also. And yes, as you can see here on the board, uh, all the important time periods the appeal time periods, important penalties, chart, etc. Everything is given in your book. Okay, everything is given in your book. Make sure that you make the full use of the things which are given in the book. And yes, at the end also, I have given the super quick revision charts or tables, we can say, of the important provisions of PMLA, which you can use for your revision purpose. I hope you are very, very clear with the PMLA chapter and you were able to revise along with me. Yes. Okay, so let's start with the next chapter that is Arbitration and Conciliation Act 1996. Simple chapter, small chapter. Let's start with it. So, uh, as the name suggests, Arbitration and Conciliation Act. Basically, arbitration and conciliation, these are nothing but the modern methods of dispute resolution or we can say alternative method of dispute resolution. Right. Uh, generally in India, we say that whenever there is any dispute between two people, they try to take the case to the court. Right. That was your litigation that we can call it as and that was called as your traditional method of dispute resolution. Now we have even got alternative method of dispute resolution, which can be uh, uh, like uh, other alternative methods of dispute resolutions are uh, it can be arbitration, it can be mediation, it can be negotiation, it can be conciliation and out of these the two most common methods of dispute resolution is arbitration and mediation. Okay, common methods are arbitration and mediation, but in for the purpose of our syllabus in this particular act, we are going to study mainly about two things. One is arbitration and the other one is conciliation, right? Now, uh, what is the main purpose of this particular act? As the name suggests, that whenever any dispute arises between any uh, two or more persons, then we are going to resolve the disputes not by traditional method, but by alternative method of dispute resolutions. And uh, this law contains the provisions relating to domestic arbitration uh, where all the parties are there in India or it can even relate to international commercial arbitration. Commercial arbitration means related to your business disputes and international arbitration means where at least one of the parties is of outside India. Provisions relating to these domestic arbitration and international commercial arbitration, these will be covered under this arbitration and conciliation uh, act. Okay, for the purpose of our exams, we are going to study mainly about arbitration and then we are going to study some basic overview, some basic overview about the conciliation provisions also. Yes, Chal. now let's, uh, let's go to the main thing that uh, uh, where we are going to study about arbitration. So ma'am, what is going to happen under arbitration? Arbitration is such a method where two or more parties, whoever are there in the disputes, they submit their disputes to a neutral person called as arbitrator who is going to give a final decision. Okay, as you can see here in the diagram also party 1, party 2, they appoint a person called as arbitral tribunal or this person can also be called as an arbitrator and this person will adjudicate. Adjudicate means he, he will determine and then he is going to give the final decision and that decision is called as the arbitral award right this is how basically the arbitration works so basically we are instead of going to the court 
we appoint a person called as arbitrator who is going to be an independent neutral person who is going to resolve our disputes i hope i am very very clear till here yes okay now going on to the next thing that is basic features of arbitration okay basic features of arbitration what is going to happen in this uh, what are the basic features of arbitration so for arbitration first most important thing that we require is the arbitration agreement okay now arbitration agreement is nothing but a documented agreement kind of a thing where uh, the parties show their desire that yes if in case of a dispute we will not go to the court rather we will come to the arbitrator to resolve the dispute all these things are documented in a document called as arbitration agreement okay that is the first primary thing that should be there mandatorily if we want to get into arbitration then there has to be a person called as arbitrator or arbitral tribunal just like a court's judge who is going to resolve the dispute but yes obviously if we want a fair decision then this person should be independent neutral unbiased etc and uh, the next important thing here is in case of arbitration is party autonomy party autonomy is nothing but freedom in arbitration we have got the freedom to choose the seat of arbitration seat of arbitration means which legal proceedings will apply say for example in case of international commercial arbitration will indian laws apply or uh, and will the indian courts provide the supportive measures or will the foreign law apply etc so we have got that freedom to choose whether we will take the supportive measures from the indian government or from the uh, like from the indian laws or from the foreign laws we have got the flexibility we have got the freedom to choose the arbitrator number of arbitrator then the place where we are going to sit and do the arbitration process in what way orally written arguments etc in what way are we going to do the arbitration process all these things all these things will be specified all these things will be specified uh, will be decided by the parties themselves so that's the reason here they have used the term the feature called as party autonomy where the parties themselves choose their own arbitrator also what happens in case of courts etc is we don't choose our judge the court decides the legal system decides who is going to be the judge for this particular case but here we choose our own arbitrator we choose the date time place where we are going to do the arbitration etc which is altogether different from the basic litigation process right then the arbitrator comes into picture and then he is going to give the final outcome that final outcome is called the arbitral award right it is called as the arbitral award which is the final decision which is given by the arbitrator this entire process remains confidential whereas litigation does not remain confidential if whatever we study in form of case law right that is available to the general public that is the litigation outcome but the arbitration process entirely remains confidential right and uh, the final decision which is given by the arbitrator that is called as the arbitral award and the arbitral award is also enforced it is made applicable in the same way just like as if it is a court's decision just like whenever a court gives a decision we with all the seriousness etc we implement that court decision similarly the decision the award which is given by the arbitrator should also be enforced very very clear with this yes okay so these were some basic features of your arbitration now in india we have got in india we have got something called as uh like you have got this arbitration in arbitration also we have got some involvement of courts see arbitration was done by the arbitrator but whenever the arbitrator needs any help or whenever we uh, need some supportive measures from the legal system we need the judicial authorities to interfere there so for the purpose of arbitration we have got two persons here mainly one is the judicial authority which in judicial authority is everyone it includes the courts it includes the special tribunals it includes the quasi judicial authorities etc everyone is included in a term called as judicial authority now ma'am which courts will provide us the supportive measures so just try to understand for international commercial arbitration only high court only high court is going to provide us the supportive measures but for domestic arbitration district court and high court both can provide us the supportive measures example whenever we require the intervention of court in between for international commercial arbitration which court will come into picture the high court will come into picture for domestic arbitration it can be the most of the times it is the district court okay suppose if we are not able to appoint the arbitrators 
we were given the authority we were given the freedom to appoint the arbitrators but for some reason if we are not able to appoint the arbitrators then in that case for international commercial arbitration we can go to the supreme court for domestic arbitration we can go to the high court high court will come into picture it will appoint the arbitrator in case of domestic arbitration and so basically most of the works or we can say all the work is done by the arbitrator only in the picture but uh, again in litigation we have court into picture in arbitration we do not have court into picture but for some supportive measures for taking some help etc we may require the help of some court so we have got the district court we have got the high court and we have got the supreme court who is going to help us for different different things and these courts they are they are getting covered in the entire term called as judicial authority okay it is going to be covered in the term called as judicial authority right now uh, taking one one thing at a time uh, remember in the basic features of arbitration the first and the most important thing that we require is the arbitration agreement okay so we had seen that arbitration agreement is nothing but a document where the parties consent that if we want to go for uh, like if we if there is any dispute then we will go for arbitration right that consent is recorded in the document called as arbitration agreement okay that consent is recorded in the document called as arbitration agreement and in case, whenever any dispute arises we refer to that document if it is written in the document that yes we will go for arbitration then we cannot unilaterally proceed to the court we have to go to the arbitrator for uh, resolving the disputes via arbitration very clear with this now arbitration agreement can be mainly in two formats mainly in two formats one is either in the main agreement itself the arbitration clause can be included example if there is a partnership deed made between the partners in that itself we can include a clause called as arbitration clause even that will be considered as a valid arbitration agreement or alternatively if we want to keep it separate then we can uh, prepare a separate agreement for it where we will write that in case of any disputes we will go for arbitration right but yes arbitration agreement has to be in writing mandatorily if it was decided over email then a communication over email is also sufficient to make an arbitration agreement okay so basically two types of arbitration agreement one is your arbitration clause the clause in the main agreement and the other one is a separate agreement which is also called as a submission agreement very very clear with this yes okay now uh, going ahead to the general principles of arbitration agreement this is very very simple now arbitration agreement is nothing but that written document or a contract which fulfills all the requirements of a valid contract it should mandatorily contain the consent of all the parties who are there because without consent the agreement is going to be totally valid and if once you have prepared the arbitration agreement then a point called as ouster of jurisdiction becomes applicable that is if you have entered into an arbitration agreement none of the parties can unilaterally proceed to the court if say for example two of them are there in the dispute one of them cannot say now no no i don't want to go for arbitration i want to go to the court no if you want to go to the court you can go but first cancel the arbitration agreement then only you can go to the court and even though your arbitration agreement suppose if it is in the form of arbitration clause what example had i given you for the arbitration clause if the arbitration clause is there in the partnership deed then also that document will be considered as a valid arbitration agreement but there is a doctrine of separability arbitration agreement will be considered separate from the partnership deed even though it is contained in the main document then too it will be considered as a separate contract okay so that's why the arbitration agreement will rule on its own jurisdiction it will not be dependent on the partnership deed it will be considered as a separate arbitration agreement yes so this was all about this was all about your general principles or basic features of your arbitration agreement now some more requirements for preparing a valid arbitration agreement first thing is obviously it has to be in writing we have already discussed about it it should mandatorily contain clear consent that all the parties shall go for arbitration they shall go for arbitration in case of any disputes <clears throat> matters which are illegal example money laundering matters can they be taken for arbitration answer is no bribery kidnapping murders relating matters can they be taken for arbitration obviously no only legal matters only legal matters can be taken for 
arbitration once the matter is submitted to the arbitrator for dispute resolution the final award is given by the arbitrator that is called as your arbitral award and yes obviously for taking any particular matter for arbitration there should be a dispute okay a dispute should be there a dispute should be submitted for the arbitration either there should be a present dispute or there should be there can be a possibility of future dispute that's the reason we prepared that arbitration agreement signature yes it is definitely required in the arbitration agreement if it is over email then signature point is not mandatory and the disputes which are submitted for arbitration should be arbitrable okay it should be arbitrable means uh, just like i told you criminal offenses these are not arbitrable these cannot be submitted for arbitration i hope i am very very clear till here these are very basic and the general points which are there under arbitration now going on to the last two things one is something called as arbitration agreement through reference okay now in the arbitration agreement we have written uh, we have written that uh, or say for example in any particular partnership deed say for example in the partnership deed we have written that uh, the disputes will be resolved as per the terms and conditions of any xyz document disputes will be resolved as per the terms and conditions of the xyz document example it will be resolved as per the terms and conditions of the association say for example if there is any clothes or uh, clothes association or um, retailers association then and we have written in our document that the disputes if any will be resolved as per the terms and conditions of the uh, clothes association then whenever any disputes arises we will have to go and check the terms and condition of that association if it is written in the terms and conditions of the association that disputes will be resolved by arbitration then we can uh, resolve the disputes by way of arbitration means it was not directly written in our document that whether we are going to go for litigation or whether we are going to go for arbitration it was referred to some other document even that is considered as a valid arbitration agreement right and the last one last one is termination of arbitration agreement or termination of arbitral agreement can it be terminated answer is yes uh, it can be terminated in three cases and in one of the cases it cannot be terminated how can it be terminated first of all it can be terminated by mutual consent of all the parties if all the parties say now no now we don't want to go for arbitration you can simply cancel it okay or if the main contract has come to an end suppose if partnership has come to an end then what is the purpose of the arbitration agreement even that will come to an end or if suppose if the law says so if the law says so that this matter cannot be resolved or these disputes cannot be resolved by arbitration then you have to cancel the arbitration agreement and the matter is going to go for litigation very very clear with this so these are the three ways mutual consent termination of the main contract and operation of law but in case of death of the parties it will not be discharged it will not be cancelled in fact it will be continued against the legal representative just like we had it in our pmla chapter also here also in case of death it will be continued against the legal representative very very clear with this so this was all about this was all about your arbitration agreement everything about the arbitration agreement right <clears throat> now let's let's talk about arbitrator or the arbitral tribunal who is this particular person he is uh, either you can use the word arbitrator or you can use the word arbitral tribunal it is used interchangeably but referring to the same person he is just like a court judge who is going to listen to the disputes and who is going to resolve the disputes and he is such a person who should remain fair and neutral to all the parties who are involved in the arbitration because the quality of the final outcome depends upon the quality of the arbitrator and he is such a person who should be capable of contracting who should be capable of entering into a contract he should be such a person to whom we are submitting the disputes he is going to adjudicate the disputes and who is going to resolve the disputes very very clear with this yes uh, what qualifications he should be having what conditions he should be fulfilling what uh, number of years of experience he should be having that will be specified by the arbitration regulations we do not have that in our syllabus okay 
you remember we had done one of the point in basic features of arbitration called as party autonomy yes what did we study in party autonomy party autonomy was such a point where the parties had the freedom to choose their own arbitrators so here the parties are going to choose their own arbitrators how are they going to choose their arbitrators or we can say how uh, arbitrators will be appointed what are the methods of appointing the arbitrator let's try to understand that okay before that also before choosing the arbitrator let's decide how many arbitrators do we need so here also the point called as party autonomy is applicable where the parties have got high level of freedom high level of freedom to decide upon the number of arbitrators in respect of number of arbitrators uh, if they want to keep uh, one arbitrator they can appoint one arbitrator if they want to keep say for example 11 arbitrators they can have even 11 number of arbitrators depending upon their case and depending upon the decision taken by the parties they can choose that how many number of arbitrators can be there in the case see if we have less number of arbitrators time taken will be less but expertise involved will also be less if we have more number of arbitrators then uh, expertise will be more but the clashes dispute between the arbitrators will be more so uh, that has to be balanced by the parties themselves that how many arbitrators are they going to appoint and yes one thing that the law has told is you can appoint whatever number of arbitrator but that number should not be an even number it should not be two four six eight ten okay it can be one three five seven nine that way so that the decision can be taken by majority in case of any disputes between the arbitrators right this is what is told about the number of arbitrators in the law called as arbitration and conciliation act okay and suppose if you are not able to decide how many number of arbitrators is to be appointed then in such a case you can appoint a sole arbitrator a single arbitrator can be appointed in such a case okay now ma'am how do we appoint the arbitrator what is the procedure for appointment of arbitrators so uh, we can say that the entire conclusion of the paragraph that is written here is uh, one thing is both the parties can come together they can mutually appoint a single arbitrator okay that is one particular basic method of appointment of arbitrator okay another method is one of the party will appoint his arbitrator another party will appoint his arbitrator and then these two arbitrators will appoint the third arbitrator okay uh, that is one thing third method is one of the parties will share a list of arbitrator with the other party other party will choose from that list of arbitrator if he is not satisfied with this list of arbitrator he will share his list of arbitrator with the first one and this will go on till they choose a final arbitrator and the last case if they are not able to appoint the arbitrator they will go and take the help of the courts to decide upon their arbitrator remember which court will come into picture in case of uh, domestic arbitration high court will come into picture and in case of international commercial arbitration the supreme court will come into picture either the courts will appoint or the courts will delegate this work to someone else and they will choose the arbitrators for us so this is the way this is the way in which the arbitrators are appointed for the purpose of this particular act yes okay now what are the requirements or uh, like uh, what are the requirements of this arbitrator so he can be of any nationality generally generally in case of domestic arbitration that person will be an Indian only but in case of international commercial arbitration that person can be of any nationality Indian or foreign he should be capable of contracting that is he should be eligible as per the Indian contract act and there should be no biasness there sh he should be totally neutral he should be independent there should be no biasness because of which because of which the final outcome is going to be the bestest one. very clear with this yes Achha. when can we say that he is biased or he may be biased suppose if that arbitrator is related to either of the parties or if he is having any interest in any of the parties or he had any interest in any of the parties in the past which can give doubts relating to independence or which can which can give doubts relating to uh, impartiality and all those things then in that case we can say that that person is a biased person or uh, say for example he was the previous lawyer of either of the parties he was he is he is a relative of either of the parties he was uh, having any financial interest in any of the parties he was a legal representative of any of the party or he has any financial interest in any of the party then we can say that yes biasness is present and we should not be appointing any such person who is biased or where we have a doubt that that particular person is
right i hope i am very very clear till your everyone yes okay now duties and liabilities going to the next one that is duties and liabilities of the arbitrator this is very very simple many of the pointers are getting uh, re, uh, repeated duties of the arbitrator obviously what duty will the arbitrator have he is given a work of resolving a particular case so he should conduct the proceedings without any delay and he should try to resolve the case as soon as possible he while resolving resolving the case he should be unbiased right he should remain impartial he should not be favoring any any of the parties right he should not be favoring any of the parties because that will again give rise to biasness he should as we have already studied in the basic features of arbitration he should keep everything confidential because in arbitration whatever is decided remains between the parties themselves okay and the most important work is he should be giving a award he should give an arbitral award that is the final decision and it should be a reasoned award he should give a proper reasoning why this award is being given right and uh, unilateral communication with one of the party communicating only with one party that should be avoided whatever documentation whatever communication we are receiving from one of the parties should be communicated to the other parties right it should be communicated to the other party so that everyone is there in the loop so that everyone knows what is happening in the uh, case right and it should ensure that whatever uh, award is being given that is complying with the legal requirement the award which is being given that should not be an illegal award right uh, he should not say that go and murder the other person that is not a proper way of giving an okay. very very clear with this yes okay now once this arbitrator comes into picture he will make sure that he uh, fulfills his duties and all those things now can this uh, arbitrator be removed can he be substituted can he be terminated answer is yes either he can do it voluntarily when the arbitrator himself says i don't want to remain in this particular case i want to leave then uh, it can so happen that without giving reasons also with or without giving reasons he can totally leave that particular case and he can decide no longer to be an arbitrator or alternatively parties say that we don't want you to be an arbitrator for example if he does not have proper expertise or he has lost interest in the case or when because of prolonged illness of the arbitrator he is not able to continue etc then in that case the arbitrator can be removed okay or say for example when the arbitration comes to an end right or if he is not able to give the final award within the prescribed time then in such case the arbitration process automatically comes to an end right or alternatively alternatively uh, when the court decides when we go and take the supportive measures from the court and the court decides that yes biasness is present if biasness is present or independence is not there then in such cases also the arbitrator can be removed very very clear with this yes so these are some of the reasons or these are some of the ways in which an arbitrator can be removed so we can classify it into two things one is he can go voluntarily or the parties can remove that particular person. yes okay now listen another thing is another thing is uh now the arbitrator came into picture the arbitrator gave the award arbitrator is going to give the award award is nothing but the final conclusive decision which will be given by the arbitrator on all the matters which were submitted for arbitration and the final award is basically called as the arbitral award right now uh, there is a possibility that uh, this, uh, either of the parties is not satisfied or is less satisfied with the award which is given by the arbitrator so if we are not satisfied then we can go and file an appeal okay we can go and file an appeal before the district court or before the high court and this appeal can be filed within a time period of three months from the date when the award is received and this three months period can be further extended by a time period of 30 days this is the time period for going and filing an appeal okay but uh, there are only restrictive grounds there are very less grounds on which we can go and file an appeal because the arbitration is basically a friendly manner in which the dispute is resolved so chances of any party not being satisfied with the award is very less but suppose if later we come to know that the arbitrator was not appointed properly or he was biased 
or he was he was lacking independence etc then in such cases we can go and file an appeal right appeal can be filed before whom appeal can be filed before the district court or the high court within a time period of 3 months and this can be further extended by a maximum period of 30 days very very clear with this yes and uh, yes before we even studied about the appeal of against arbitral award you need to know that what are the types of arbitral award okay types of arbitral award one is the final award which is given by the arbitrator full and final on all the matters which is submitted for arbitration that is nothing but your final award then there is something called as interim award interim award is uh, one of the award which is given before the final award suppose we had submitted multiple matters for arbitration and if we solving one by one then the decision given on one 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 award will be called as the interim award and the final one will be called as the final award okay or anything which remains doubtful till the time the final award is passed that award will be called as the interim award then there is something called a settlement award. Settlement award is the uh, is such an award which is actually just decided by the parties themselves. Parties themselves decide that what is going to be the final award and it is just supervised by the arbitrator. That's why it is called as the settlement award. Okay, decision is taken by whom? Decision is taken by the parties. It is just supervised by the arbitrator. And the last one is something called as additional award, award given on the left out matters. Okay, suppose if after giving final award also if the parties point out that the decision on so and so matter is pending. Then in that case decision given on so and so left out matter will be called as the additional award. And for that we parties can go and make a request within a time period of 30 days of final award. Means once we got the final award from that day within 30 days we can go and make a request to the arbitrator. Sir so and so matter is left out. Please give a decision on that and that is called as your additional very clear with this okay so four types final award interim award settlement award and additional award okay and award is such a thing award is such a thing which is which should be mandatorily first of all it has to be given by the arbitrator and in arbitrator also if you have multiple arbitrator then it should be given by majority of the arbitrators it should be in writing it should be dated and it should be signed by all the arbitrator if some arbitrator is not agreeing suppose if we had five arbitrators four of them said yes one of them said no then that one would not sign it if the one is if that one of them is not signing it then he should be giving a reason that why he is not agreeing with the award and the award as we have already studied it should be a deliberate award it should be a reasoned award that why such an award is given it should be clearly written it should not be vague it should not leave doubts in the minds of the reason uh, in the in the minds of the readers it should be a possible it should be a possible award it should be capable of being performed it should be realistic in nature it should not happen that uh, go and bring stars from the sky that kind of an award is not possible and obviously it should be a legal award it should not be an illegal award it should not say go and kill the other person matter will be solved right and it should not be against india's public policy it should be a reasoned award it should be given as soon as possible as fast as possible these are the requirements right these are the requirements of a valid arbitral award very very clear till here okay uh, so till here basically we have seen about basic features of arbitration then we saw about arbitral agreements right or arbitration agreement then we saw about arbitrator then we saw about arbitral awards right how an arbitral award should be what were the types of arbitral awards etc now going on to challenging the arbitral awards as we had already seen can we go and challenge the arbitral award yes before whom can we go and challenge the award it can be challenged before the district court or before the high court within a time period of three months which can be further extended by 30 days this is what we studied right Mm, yes, this is what we studied, Thir uh, 3 months plus uh, 30 days. Uh, within this much uh, time, we can go and file an appeal. Now, uh, I had also mentioned that arbitral award can be challenged only on some specific grounds. Only if later it is found that there was biasness uh by done by the arbitrator or if we came to know that later on we came to know that the arbitration agreement itself was invalid or the party was incapable of entering into an arbitration agreement or dispute was such which was not arbitrable 
or legal requirements while giving the arbitral award were not followed in such cases or suppose if we we'll, in case of international commercial arbitration we come to know that the decision given was against the india's public policy then in such cases we have to go and challenge that particular award so the award can be challenged before the district court or the high court as the case may be uh, when the matter goes to the district court or the high court what can be the consequences of the same so the order can be set aside means the court will say that no the uh, decision given by the arbitrator is nonsense do it again next one is it can confirm it can say that the decision given by the arbitrator is perfect or it can modify the district court or the high court will itself modify the order and the last one is it may remit back to the tribunal it may remit back to the tribunal means it will give it back to the tribunal to do some rectifications means it will not do the rectifications on its own it will tell the tribunal the arbitral tribunal or the arbitrator to do the rectifications this is given here that is consequences of challenge set aside confirm modify or remit it back to the tribunal and once the arbitral award is finalized after that it has to be enforced enforced means to make it applicable usko implement karna to make it to implement that particular award which is given by the arbitrator as if it is a court's decision means we are not supposed to take it very lightly that ah this is of arbitrator this is not of the court you don't have to do that right so this is where this is where your arbitration comes to an end where which was you know very simple very general pointers were getting repeated in the chapter so just a simple reading of the chapter and solving the subjective questions from the question bank will help you to gain a good uh, control or uh, this thing over the chapter yes now going on to the basic parts of conciliation we don't have the entire conciliation proceedings for our syllabus but we have got the basics of it let's try to do whatever is there for us yes now just try to understand first of all arbitration was such a method arbitration was such a method where uh, the parties took the dispute before a person called as arbitrator arbitrator resolved it and he gave an arbitral award okay now we have got something called as conciliation again this is an alternative method of dispute resolution where the parties go to a person called as conciliator and by way of a confidential discussion they are going to resolve their disputes okay now ma'am uh, what distinguishes between uh, arbitration and conciliation so just try to understand again this is a voluntary process means the parties may decide to go for conciliation I, alternatively they can go for litigation they can go for arbitration or they can come for conciliation again it is voluntary it is not mandatory the most important point of distinguish here is it is non adversarial means in arbitration what happens is we try to fight okay the parties try to fight that i am correct you are wrong and that kind of a thing happens but in case of conciliation what happens is parties don't compete against each other they resolve it in in a, in a very peaceful manner they try to resolve the dispute in a, in a very peaceful manner they don't compete against each other and they don't try to prove that the other party is wrong so in a very friendly manner they try to resolve the dispute and the work of the conciliator here is just to monitor the proceedings the decision will be taken by the parties themselves the work of conciliator is just to monitor just like the settlement award that we had done in arbitration same thing is applicable in case of conciliation here the decision is taken by the rb uh, by the parties and it is just monitored or supervised by the conciliator final award will be give, will be given in writing by the conciliator that has to be legal that will be binding and throughout the process confidentiality will be applicable that the matter does not go out just like arbitration arbitration was also confidential and even this is going to be confidential very clear with this okay and whenever conciliation is happening in india provisions are given under arbitration and conciliation act arbitration and conciliation act will be applicable and code of civil procedure 1908 this particular law will be applicable very very clear with this right and whenever the parties wish to start the conciliation one party will send the invitation to the other party uh, stating that we have got so and so dispute so let's take this matter for conciliation one possibility is the other party will accept the invite or the other party will reject the invite and uh, some reply yes or no some reply has to be received within a time period of 30 days from the date when we are sending the invitation if the other party accepts the invitation within 30 days then the conciliation process will start if he does not reply or there is a no reply then they cannot go for conciliation 
okay if suppose they plan to go for conciliation then conciliators will be appointed conciliators will be appointed by the parties themselves same party autonomy is there right or if they don't want to appoint a conciliator they can go and make a request to the court and the court can appoint a conciliator for them once a conciliator comes into picture he will see all the documents evidences etc and then he will start supervising or monitoring the entire process very very clear with this yes now if if we want to cancel or if we want to terminate the conciliation proceedings it can be done either the parties can mutually sign an agreement where they will say that okay we are done okay or uh, we, we we want to cancel the conciliation proceedings that is done that is one thing or when the conciliation award is given at that time also the conciliation proceedings comes to an end uh, very clear with this yes so uh, these are the two methods or even the conciliator can say that i don't want to handle this particular case then also the conciliation proceedings will come to an end and the final award which is given the final award which is given by the conciliator here is called as the settlement agreement or memorandum of conciliation settlement agreement or memorandum of conciliation what is going to happen why is it called as a settlement agreement this is just like a settlement award here the decisions are taken by the parties it is just supervised it is just monitored by the conciliator and that's the reason it is called as a settlement agreement or memorandum of conciliation uh, it has to be signed by the conciliator mandatorily dated signed etc and it has to be enforced okay it has to be enforced as if it is a court's decision enforcement will always happen as per the code of civil procedure law okay enforcement point we had studied for arbitration also same enforcement thing is applicable for conciliation also and the last one as we have already studied just like your arbitration process was confidential same way even your conciliation process is going to be uh, confidential this entire process can be confident uh, has to be confidential mandatorily so whatever things are discussed in conciliation cannot be used in the court of law later on because whatever was discussed in conciliation has to remain in conciliation on i hope i am very very clear with this yes these were the basic pointers of conciliation and yes one important term which is given here is which we discussed in the beginning itself that is international commercial arbitration uh, which is uh, for disputes which are commercial in nature and where at least one of the parties is either an individual of the other country or it is a company of the other country or it is any aop or boi of the other country or it is government of the foreign country one person who is of outside india then such a, a case will be called as an international commercial arbitration and just for your understanding we have given distinguishes uh, at the end of the chapter which is there uh, Uh, at the end of the chapter in your book distinguish between litigation arbitration mediation conciliation etc which you can just refer it once yes so uh, this is this is basically a very very simple chapter very simple chapter because many of the pointers are getting repeated here and once you understand the concept like what is arbitration what is conciliation who what is an arbitration agreement who is an arbitrator uh, what kind of award he gives and if you understand that much then you know uh, the chapter becomes very very simple yes okay let's start with the next chapter that is foreign contribution regulation act 2010 along with all the amendments which are applicable uh so in this particular law the important things two important terms that we are going to study one is something called as foreign contribution and the second one is something called as foreign hospitality if we are receiving foreign contribution or foreign hospitality from the other country other country is nothing but foreign source in this particular chapter then is it allowed is it restricted or what are the provisions applicable to it all those things are going to be covered in this particular law that is foreign contribution regulation act Yes, let's start with it. Now, uh, what is the purpose of this act, or why was this act uh, incorporated? Now, they say that whenever we are receiving any sorts of foreign contribution, we will see the book definition of foreign contribution or foreign hospitality. Whenever we are receiving foreign contributions or foreign hospitality from the other country, in some cases it can be in good faith, but in some cases it can even lead to threat to the Indian economy, or it can even lead to threat. uh to the indian culture etc 
for that purpose some foreign contributions are regulated okay regulated means government will allow us to accept the foreign contributions from the other country just that we have to do the reporting to the government okay Achha. in some cases it can so happen that if we are receiving any foreign contribution from our enemy country then that can be for creating some disharmony in our country that can be for uh, some illegal activities in our country so in some cases the government can even prohibit the acceptance of foreign contribution so basic two purposes of the act either it will regulate the foreign contribution or it will prohibit the foreign contribution right now we need to understand uh, first of all the meaning of the term called as foreign contribution foreign hospitality let's first understand that foreign contribution as so one thing that you have to remember throughout the chapter is in this chapter we are not giving any foreign contribution or foreign hospitality we are accepting we are only receiving there is only incoming there is no outgoing okay so uh, for what 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 all things are covered in the foreign contribution foreign contribution can be in any of the three forms it can be in form of any article that is anything it can be in form of any currency which can be an indian currency or it can be a foreign currency or it can be in any form of security shares debentures etc which can be indian security or it can be a foreign security so if you are receiving any i'll just show it to you also if you are receiving any uh thing from the foreign source from the other country which can be in form of article currency or security then that thing will be called as a foreign contribution and foreign contributions can either be regulated or foreign contributions can be prohibited okay one exceptional point which is there for the term called as article is when we receive any article for personal use okay and if the market value of that particular article on the date of receipt does not exceed rupees 1 lakh then that is excluded from the term called as foreign contribution only article a uh, article which is received for personal use whose value does not exceed rupees 1 lakh will be excluded from the term called as foreign contribution okay all these things we are receiving from whom all these things we are receiving from a foreign source okay so ma'am what all things who all will be covered in this foreign source foreign source will include the other country's government it will include any foreign company it will include the foreign government it will include uh, any co uh, corporation outside india it will include foreign company it will include mncs it will include any societies outside india trusts outside india it will include the foreign citizens etc also if we are receiving anything from the other country that is called as a foreign source and if we are receiving article security or currency from the foreign source then that, that is called as the foreign contribution very very clear with this yes and then there is something called as foreign hospitality now what do you mean by the term called as foreign hospitality foreign hospitality is not in form of a tangible thing it is in form of an intangible thing okay it is in the form of intangible thing it is in form of a service if we are receiving a foreign hospitality that is someone from the other country someone from the foreign source is hosting me is calling me to their country and telling that they will bear my travel expenses they will bear my stay expenses they will bear my medical treatment expenses then in that case that other person is providing me the foreign hospitality okay can i say i am receiving here yes incoming only i am only receiving here but that i am not receiving in form of a tangible thing it is in form of a service where the other person is hosting me other person is going to bear my stay travel and the medical treatment expenses that is called as a foreign hospitality okay so two important terms one was foreign contribution and the other one was your foreign hospitality very very clear with this yes okay so uh, these were the most important things in definition that we had to do one was foreign contribution other one was foreign source and the next one is a foreign hospitality and yes one more important point that you need to remember for the purpose of foreign source is united nations world bank international monetary funds you you must have heard about these associations etc or agencies etc right united nations international monetary fund world bank etc their main work their main work is to provide funding to the needy countries etc so if you are receiving anything from them then that is not considered as a foreign contribution 
okay so united nation imf world bank are excluded from the term called as foreign source it is written here okay it is excluded from the term called as foreign source i hope i am very very clear with this yes now let's try to understand the provisions relating to foreign contributions first two most important sections that we have to do first year is section number 3 and section number 4 okay section numbers also to be remembered section 3 and section 4 Section three talks about prohibition to accept foreign contribution. That so and so person, list of persons are given. So and so persons are totally prohibited from accepting the foreign contribution. Ma'am, who all are prohibited? So any election candidate or any person related to a newspaper company. It can be the uh, correspondent, columnist, owner, editor, printer of a newspaper because he can publish. something against the country if he is receiving the foreign contribution from an enemy country right or uh, it can be a public servant it can be a member of legislature it can be any person who is related to any news channel etc it can be a political party it can be a uh, office bearer of a political party a secretary of a political party member of a political party and all all such people so any people did you see any people related to the government any people related to politics any people related to media either it can be newspaper or audio or visual audio visual news etc or even fm broadcast of audio news any person related to that that is owner of a fm channel or you know editor or such people so these people are all together prohibited from accepting any foreign contribution because they have they have told that if these people accept foreign contribution then that creates a risk okay that creates a risk for our country very clear with this so they are all together prohibited and uh, we it should also not happen that suppose if i am a non prohibited person if i am accepting foreign contribution i cannot even transfer it to a political party means a political party just example which i have taken from section number 3 a political party cannot directly or indirectly accept any foreign contribution that is totally prohibited very very clear with this yes okay then uh, uh, going on to section number 4 everyone with me section number 4 is basically uh talking about exceptions section number 3 said that so and so people cannot accept the foreign contribution section number 4 says that person to whom section 3 shall not apply means what are they trying to tell us here is the people who were even mentioned in section number 3 those prohibited people they can accept amount from the foreign sources in these circumstances they can accept example if they are receiving anything called as salary or wages from the foreign source or if they are receiving any payment in course of international trade or commerce or if they are receiving any amount important point if they are receiving any amount from their relatives they can accept it however when they are receiving anything more than 10 lakh rupees in a year they have to inform to the central government within 3 months of the receipt okay so they even a political party office bearer can accept anything from its relatives just that whenever the amount exceeds rupees 10 lakh it has to intimate to the central government in form number fc1 within a time period of 3 months okay or any amount which is received in ordinary course of business via normal banking channels or anything which is received in the form of scholarship or stipend etc that can be received no problem in that i hope i am very very clear with this yes so uh, section 3 was talking about total prohibition section 4 says that all these things can be received even by the prohibited people okay now what is the logic because all the things which are return here in section number 4 these are actually not here foreign contribution salary wages amount received in international trade etc these are received from the foreign source but this is not received for free we would have rendered service that's why we have received it so that's why these are allowed you can still accept it okay but gift is one uh, sorry this amount received from relative is one important point uh. this is received for no consideration so when you are receiving it there is no restriction on it except that whenever the amount received exceeds 10 lakh rupees uh, in a particular year from all the relatives taken together then you have to intimate the central government that you have received you can still accept it you just have to intimate it to the central government that you have received 
very very clear with this okay so section number 3 and 4 section number 3 and 4 is basically talking about foreign contribution we have still now not spoken about foreign hospitality right now section number 6 which is going to come up here section number 6 talks about your foreign hospitality okay now what was the meaning of foreign hospitality foreign hospitality was service received from the foreign source where the other person is ready to bear my stay expenses travel expenses and medical treatment expenses outside india okay so now what are they telling us here is whenever any particular person whenever uh, any particular person specified year that is whenever these five persons are accepting any foreign hospitality they have to take a prior approval from the mha ministry of home affairs this approval is required only for those five people mla member of legislature office bearer of a political party government servants judges and government employees whenever these five people are accepting any foreign hospitality they can accept but only after taking prior approval of mha so ma'am what about other people people like you and me we can definitely accept foreign hospitality without any approvals only approval is required for these five okay so what is the process for that whenever we want to take this permission go and make an application to the mha secretary in form number fc2 attach the necessary documents invitation letter etc and tell the authority that we require the permission and you should take the permission at least 2 weeks before your departure means whenever you are going to leave india before that at least 2 weeks in advance you have to take the permission okay if the permission is granted to you you can avail that foreign hospitality and you can go to the other country acha it can so happen that i took the permission for stay expenses and travel expenses and after going there there was a need for emergency medical treatment then in that case you can avail the medical treatment uh, expenses first or you can avail that medical treatment service first and then intimate the central government within one month of receipt plus the manner in which it was received like from whom did you receive how did you receive intimate it to the central government within one month and that intimation is also required only when the amount is 1 lakh or more uh, only when the amount is more than rupees 1 lakh if the amount is up to rupees 1 lakh you need not even intimate the central government about this emergency medical treatment i hope i am very very clear till here everyone yes okay then the next section that is section number 7 very very important because this was amended some time back section number 7 says that you can see from the heading itself prohibition to transfer fc to other person if i have accepted the foreign contribution contribution then be it a registered person be it an unregistered person under fcra i cannot transfer this foreign contribution to any other person under any circumstance earlier there were certain circumstances where we were allowed to transfer the fc but now they say that if you have accepted the fc you only utilize the fc don't transfer it to any other person okay earlier there was this provision that registered person can transfer to another registered person but then there can be a possibility that we are transferring it to a prohibited person we are transferring it to a political party etc which is not allowed so they say that now transfer itself is restricted if arpita has accepted foreign contribution arpita only has to use that foreign contribution very very clear with this yes okay then going ahead to the next section that is section number 8 okay what is the section number 8 talks about section number 8 says that it puts certain restriction that whenever we have accepted any foreign contribution we will not use a foreign contribution for speculative activities because there is a chance of losing the money and we have received it for free we have not paid anything for foreign contribution so why to lose it so they say that don't use it for speculative activities okay maximum 20% should be used for administrative expenses balance has to be used for the main purpose for which we have accepted the foreign contribution example if i have accepted the foreign contribution for uh, using it for poor people or needy people then maximum 20% should be spent for admin expenses for this charitable activity balance 80% should be used for the benefit of the poor people okay and if you want to use more than 20% for admin expenses please take the prior approval of central government 
ओके सो दीज आर द टू मोस्ट इंपॉर्टेंट रेस्ट्रिक्शन फर्स्ट वन स्पेक्यूलेटिव यूज फॉर स्पेक्यूलेटिव एक्टिविटीज नॉट अलाउड एट ऑल एंड एडमिनिस्ट्रेटिव एक्सपेंसिस देर इज अ कैप ऑफ ट्वेंटी परसेंट इफ यू वॉन्ट टू यूज मोर देन ट्वेंटी परसेंट फॉर एडमिन एक्सपेंसिस टेक द प्रायर अप्रूवल ऑफ सेंट्रल very very clear with this yes and then section number 9 is a one time read kind of a section which says that cg has pa other powers also to prohibit receipt of fc in section number 3 it had told that so and so people cannot accept foreign contribution apart from that also cg can put restriction and even for section number 6 remember cg had given restrictions for foreign hospitality that those five people have to take first prior approval from the mha then only it can accept foreign hospitality so apart from the restrictions given in section 3 4 uh, 6 apart from that also if central government is of the opinion that a uh, sovereignty and integrity of the country is going to get affected or public interest is getting affected election uh, process is getting affected uh, disharmony is getting created in our country then central government can put restrictions and it can prohibit acceptance of foreign contribution and foreign hospitality so basically they are telling that central government has got huge powers and that is given in section number 9 very clear with this yes okay then going on to the procedural part of the chapter conceptual part of the chapter is over okay now going on to the procedural part what is given in section number 11 section number 11 says that whenever any particular person whenever any particular person wants to accept foreign contribution that particular person has to accept a certificate of registration or a registration certificate from the central government uh, whenever he wants to uh, or uh, use the foreign contribution for cultural activities educational activities religious activities or social program and he wants to accept foreign contribution example i want to do charitable activities here in india for which i accepted foreign contribution donations then in that case i need to obtain a certificate of registration from the central government okay for that purpose for that purpose acha and one more thing if you have not got the registration certificate then make sure that you have at least taken the prior permission of the central government see registration certificate means it is going to be for some years and prior permission is going to be just for that particular transaction so first priority is registration certificate but if it is a one time thing then you can even go for prior permission from the central government okay for that purpose go and make an application to the central government for registration certificate go and make the application in form number fc3a okay fc3a uh, along with a fees of rupees 10000 and if you want to go for your uh, prior approval then you can go in form number fc3b along with fees of 5000 rupees go and make an application to the central government for opening this particular uh, for opening this particular account or for or we can say uh, for taking the obtaining the registration certificate and uh, before uh, obtaining the registration certificate make sure that you have a fcra account this is just like your bank account and uh, then only go and make the application to the central government that you want to receive the foreign contribution yes so either you can go for registration certificate or you can go for prior permission but before going for both of these thing you should be having a fcra account that is mandatory okay once your application reaches the central government the central government will take a time period of normally 90 days and within 90 days it will either allow or reject you from accepting the foreign contribution if it has allowed you then well and good if it has rejected then it will communicate the reasons to the applicant that why it has not allowed you to open the uh, to accept the foreign contribution and if if say for example the person who has made an application if that person is a benami person or he has been convicted of some offenses or he was previously involved in uh, some misutilization of funds or if he has uh, he is doing this for his personal benefit or he has contravened any provisions of the act etc then in that case central government can directly say no for accepting the foreign contributions very very clear with this yes acha now once if the government says that okay you are allowed you can now accept the foreign contribution and we have granted you a registration certificate then that registration certificate is going to be valid for a period of 5 years once granted it is going to be valid for a period of 5 years but if rejected 
if rejected then you cannot make a second application for a period of 6 months cooling period of 6 months if once rejected you can make a fresh application only after a period of 6 months very very clear with this yes okay then uh, 5 years is there now what will happen after a period of 5 years now after a period of 5 years there can be a possibility that your certificate gets will obviously get expired at the period at the end of 5 years so can we go and file for uh, renewal of the certificate answer is yes okay uh, one second i'll just show it to you here hmm. we can go for renewal of the certificate at the end of 5 years what they say here is wordings are a little different but the conclusion here is renewal should be done in advance that is during the last 6 months before expiry okay if it is getting expired in december then between uh, the previous 1st july to 31st december the application for renewal of certificate should be filed and that application can be filed in form number fc3c okay that has to be done in the last uh, 6 months along with a fees of rupees 5000 that is for renewal if the central government is satisfied it will provide you the renewal within a time period of 90 days and the renewed certificate will also be valid for a period of 5 years suppose if you are not if you did not if you fail to do the renewal within the last 6 months then you can do it in the period of next 1 year also uh, along with your late fee of rupees 5000 and if you fail to do it even after the next one year then after that your certificate will be cancelled and you'll have to go with a fresh application okay so this was about your renewal certificate now another thing is something called as uh, your um, identification document whenever you're going and making an application to the central government that you require this permission for fc or you require the registration certificate for fc etc then in that case the government is going to ask you for some identification document and aadhar of all the persons associated example if it is an individual person then aadhar of that individual person if it is a company etc then aadhar of all the office bearers and directors etc has to be submitted and if someone is not having an aadhar then the copy of passport has to be submitted as a uh, identity proof okay now if suppose the government is of the opinion that if central government is satisfied that uh, there can be some grounds because of which the certificate can be cancelled there can be some grounds because of which the certificate may be cancelled and we are just doing the investigation then for the timing the certificate can be suspended okay for a period of 180 days which can be further extended by another period of 180 days 180 plus 180 days during these period your certificate can be suspended and during suspension we cannot accept any new fc right and about the existing fc you can utilize maximum 25 percent that too after taking the prior permission for from the central government means whenever the central government has a doubt on us that we are violating certain terms and conditions then before cancelling it can first pass an order for suspending the certificate during suspension we cannot utilize we cannot receive any new fc and with about the existing fc which is there with us we can utilize maximum 25 percent of the unutilized amount and the balance uh, can be utilized only after revocation of suspension Achha, after suspension it can so happen that the central government may even cancel our certificate if we have violated the terms and conditions if it was in public interest to cancel it if we were defunct or dormant for a period of last two years or if we have violated any terms and conditions of the act or the rules either we have violated the terms and conditions written in the certificate or if we have violated the act or the rules itself then in such cases after giving a reasonable opportunity of being heard our certificate can be cancelled and once it is cancelled then uh, we cannot go for a new certificate for a period of three years okay so here there is a cooling period of three years if your certificate has been cancelled yes and the last one there is suspension of certificate means uh, sorry uh, surrender of certificate means if we think that the purpose for which we had accepted the foreign contribution is over and if we have utilized our foreign contributions entirely then we can go and make an application to the central government that sir our work is done and we wish to surrender our certificate central government after making all the inquiries etc it may cancel our cert or it may accept the application for surrender of certificate 
very very clear with this and suppose if once our certificate has been cancelled or surrendered and after that we have some unutilized FC kept with us okay then in such cases that FC is going to waste that FC is going to waste in the central government means central government will give it uh, to some particular person for its utilization but now we cannot have that unutilized FC kept with us very very clear till here yes so this was about your fresh application for registration certificate cancellation surrender of certificate cancellation of certificate renewal of certificate and surrender of certificate right those pointers are given up here so till here your basic procedures part till here your basic procedures part is done now let's go ahead to the last part of the chapter which talks about accounts audit and all those things so we had studied that before going and making an application to the central government for registration certificate or for prior permission we have to open an account called as fcra account that fcra account has to be in the branch of sbi at new delhi okay uh, that has to be there you can open only one account for receiving the foreign contribution that has to be in SBI New Delhi branch for utilization either you can use the same FCRA account or you can open other accounts that is only for utilization huh? for utilization also you can open in SBI New Delhi or you can open in any other scheduled bank okay but for receiving you can have only one single FCRA account and as soon as as soon as any particular transaction happens in that fcra account the banks will report about your transaction to the central government you will report to the central government that is different and even the banks will report it to the central government that you have done so and so transaction and that reporting is done almost real time that is within 48 hours from that particular transaction very very clear with this yes okay then going ahead uh, from time to time from time to time we are required to submit various reports to the central government some some reports will be talking about receipt of foreign contribution uh, copies of your uh, income expenditure account receipts and payments account that can be for the entire financial year then uh, you will be required to submit the annual returns then uh, you will be required to submit the details relating to articles that you have received in the form of foreign contribution you will be required to submit the statement of your bank account copy those are the procedural things that you will be required to submit to the central government okay now now listen uh, first we discussed about opening of a bank account that is your FCRA account FCRA account one account will be for receipt which will be in SBI New Delhi branch then you can either use the same account for utilization of FC or you can open separate multiple accounts for utilization of FC okay now uh, that is for the bank account now let's talk about accounts and audit every person who is either registered under fcra or who has obtained prior permission under fcra that particular person has to maintain separate set of books of accounts for fcra transactions in which he will maintain the full details of how much fc is received how much fc is utilized and all those things separate set of books of accounts should be uh, maintained for that particular purpose and for that mandatory every year audit is not required but central government can conduct a special audit and a surprise audit into the books of accounts relating to this foreign contribution that officer who is appointed for doing the audit can enter the premises uh, after sunrise and before sunset for the purpose of doing the audit of your books of account very very clear with this so this was talking about your accounts and audit now uh, the next important thing here is which is talking about the adjudication okay next important thing here is talking about the adjudication now uh, suppose if uh, we have received any foreign contribution and if that foreign contribution is received in contravention example if we have received some article currency or security which is in contravention of the law then who will decide whether contravention has happened or not then that is generally decided by two persons either by the session court or by uh, assistant session judge session court or assistant session judge session court uh, assistant session judge will come into picture when the amount does not exceed rupees 10 lakh and for all the other cases the matter will be handled by the session court 
yes so these people will decide whether confiscation of the foreign contribution should be done or not if it is a small matter that is where the value does not exceed rupees 10 lakh okay then that will be decided by the assistant session judge otherwise the matters will be decided by the session court okay now if the order is passed by the assistant session judge that yes there is a contravention and if you are not happy with the order then in that case the appeal will be filed before the session court if the order was passed by the session court and if we are not happy with the order passed by the session court then the appeal will be filed before the high court and so the hierarchy is assistant session judge session court and the high court okay and appeal has to be preferred within a time period of one month an extension of maximum one more month can be provided in such cases very very clear with this okay now whenever any order has been passed by the central government say for example central government had passed an order for uh, not giving me the registration certificate it rejected the registration certificate to be given to me etc and whenever the central government is of the opinion that there is a mistake in its order it can do revision of the order on its own it can do suo moto revision also but that can be done only for a period of one year only within a period of one year from the date of order very very clear with this so revision of order can be done by the central government i hope i am very very clear till here okay then after that the next thing which is coming up here is offenses and penalties which is not to be remembered for the purpose of this chapter offenses by companies we have already done in the pmla chapter that whenever any offense has been done by any company in the fcra chapter then the who will be liable as who will be held as guilty the person in charge the person in charge will be held as guilty but if he proves that it was done without his knowledge or he had exercised due diligence to prevent that offense then he shall not be liable right Achha. then there is something called as compounding of offenses okay if there is any such offense which is done under fcra which does not involve imprisonment then we can go and make an application before the authorities that sir please compound our offense compound our offense means please reduce our offense please reduce our uh, punishment but but if some person has again committed any offense within a time period of three years of the previous offense Today I have done an offense and within three years I have done similar offense. Then for the second offense I am not going to get any compound. If it was done, if it was repeated within a time period of three years. Yes and then you have got some miscellaneous provisions coming up here which are just one time provisions. And this was, this was all about, this was all about your FCRA provision. So in, uh, so, in this particular chapter, most important things is, first of all, the definition of your foreign contribution, foreign hospitality, foreign source. Okay, then section number 3467, 34678, 34678, these being your most important section which covers all the conceptual provisions. And after that, you have to just go and see those procedural part, that is, how to get a registration certificate, when can it get cancelled, uh, when can it get suspended and all those things. Okay, 3, 4, 6, 7, 8 being your most important uh, conceptual sections for the purpose of this chapter. I hope I am very very clear till here. Yes. Okay, so let's start with the super quick revision of the next chapter that is IBC 2016. A uh, simple chapter but a little lengthy chapter as compared to the previous chapters. Uh, let's start with it. Now in this particular code, Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code, we are going to study that suppose if a corporate person goes insolvent, if a corporate person becomes uh, bankrupt or if that person declares its bankruptcy, then what is the further process? What is the uh, next thing that uh, or the final resort that can happen in case of your insolvency and bankruptcy? Yes. So now you are uh, basically you have got this, this, this code was introduced in the in Lok Sabha in the year 2015 and finally in uh, May 2016 it had got the president's assent and that's the time when this particular law had become a code. 
सो दिस इज वन सच पर्टिकुलर स्टेज इंसॉल्वेंसी बैंक इज वन सच पर्टिकुलर स्टेज और आई कैन से इंसॉल्वेंसी इज वन सच पर्टिकुलर स्टेज वेयर अ पर्सन लाइबिलिटीज अ पर्सन एसेट्स हैव गॉन डाउन इट हैज गॉन डाउन एंड इट्स लाइबिलिटीज हैव इंक्रीज एंड द पर्सन डज नॉट हैव सफिशियंट एसेट्स टू पे ऑफ इट्स आउटसाइड लाइबिलिटीज दैट इज द पोजिशन दैट इज द स्टेज वेन वी कैन से दैट इंसॉल्वेंसी केस हैज अराइजन एंड वेन दैट पर्टिकुलर पर्सन गोज एंड मेक्स एन एप्लीकेशन टू द अथॉरिटी डिक्लेयरिंग हिज इंसॉल्वेंसी एट दैट पर्टिकुलर टाइम वी कैन से दैट दिस पर्सन हैज बिकम बैंक Yes. Now, uh, in case of corporate persons, when we talk about companies and LLP specifically, for for the purpose of our syllabus for paper four, we have got insolvency only of corporate person. Corporate person includes your company as well as your LLP. Whenever these people are going for uh, insolvency, uh, there can be two resorts. Either that particular person can be revived. Okay. Again, we we can revive. We can do the reconstruction of that particular person, and that particular company can again. in come into existence or if that does not work then in that case the company goes for liquidation right now what was the purpose now before 2016 also there would have been definitely many companies and many other persons who have, who would have become insolvent but now what was the purpose of bringing this new code in the year 2016 so yes they wanted to consolidate there were many laws relating to insolvency they wanted to consolidate all those laws and they wanted to make a single law for this insolvency purpose they wanted to amend the old stringent laws and introduce the uh, new one they wanted to fix a time period within which the cases should be resolved otherwise we know that how the system works here if a particular case comes up it goes on for years and years then uh, more um, priority or more preference has been given to employees and workmen we'll see further in the chapter and because of this uh, you know uh, overall interest because of this code they have made sure that overall interest of all the stakeholders of the company is protected and for some other um, uh, reasons also this particular code was introduced and this distinguishes this particular code from the other codes okay in other other laws which were prevailing earlier we had many authorities who were there into the picture but when it comes to ibc there is a single authority to whom we are supposed to approach when we want to go for the cases of insolvency and bankruptcy yes so this particular code contains provisions for companies also it contains provisions for individuals and partnership firms also and it contains a procedural part also okay what we have to study for the purpose of this chapter is mainly insolvency uh, resolution and liquidation process for corporates and whenever i am using the word corporate for the purpose of this chapter it includes your company as well as your llp for the purpose of paper 4 you do not have insolvency relating to individuals and partnership okay now we need to understand a few terms in this particular chapter in this ibc now in ibc first of all we have got a most important authority called as ibbi okay first is ibbi ibbi stands for insolvency and bankruptcy board of india okay within ibbi you have got three more authorities coming up there one is your ipa ipa stands for insolvency professional agencies insolvency professional agencies is nothing but it is just like your institute which regulate its members okay similarly insolvency professional agencies are formed institutes are formed for promoting the for, for you know for um, uh, looking after the professional growth of its members for uh, looking after the ethics which is to be followed by its members or the code of ethics which is to be followed by its members then to uh, promote the services of its members okay so ipa is basically an institute which is going to look after its members members of ipa is called as what members of ipa is uh, ipa is called as ips that is insolvency professionals these are those professional persons who are going to help us okay who are going to help us to resolve the cases of insolvency so the first person who comes into picture was your insolvency professional agency it is the institute which is going to regulate its members members are called as what members are called as insolvency professional so insolvency professionals plays the most important role one of the most important role in this particular code because insolvency professional are the people who are going to see whether revival is possible or not or whether liquidation should be done uh, or 
and uh, during the insolvency process how to manage the working of that insolvent company how to run the business of that insolvent company everything will be done by this insolvency professional basically these insolvency professional clear the ibc examinations which are conducted by the IBBI. They clear the examination and after all those process etc. They get the designation of this insolvency professionals. Right. And then the last one is your information utility. Information utility is nothing but it is a centralized database. Okay. It is a centralized database which contains all the information about the defaulters. That is all the information about your uh, persons who are insolvent. Okay, that information can be used by the banks, financial institutions before they provide loan. They can go and check from the centralized database whether this person's financial history is good or not, his credit history is good or not, should we advance him the loan or not. So all this information will be available from this document called as information utility. Okay, all these people, all these people come under whom? All these people come under the IBBI, Insolvency and Bankruptcy Board of India. Very, very clear with this. Achha. And now one of the most important persons here in the chapter is the adjudicating authority. Okay, adjudicating authority as the name suggests, adjudicating is nothing but the person or the authority who is going to uh, look after the cases of insolvency. See, when we say there was a professional person who was handling the cases of insolvency, that was your insolvency professional. But from government side, from the law side also, there has to be one authority, right? And that authority is nothing but the adjudicating authority. If suppose any particular person is considered as an insolvent, we know that we have to go and make an application to the adjudicating authority. No multiple authorities, no multiple windows, nothing. You just have a sole authority there that is your adjudicating authority. Okay, now when we are talking about adjudicating authority for corporate persons, corporate includes your company as well as LLP. When we talk about adjudicating authority for corporate person, we have got the first level of authority is NCLT. Okay, uh, if suppose you are not happy with the order given by the NCLT, then we can go and file an appeal before the NCLAT and then before the Supreme Court. Very clear with this. This is for the corporate persons and for other persons, you have got the DRT, then the DRAT and then the Supreme Court. This is your adjudicating authority to whom we are supposed to go and file a complaint. Okay, to whom we are supposed to go and file a complaint uh, as soon as or we have to go and make an uh, application kind of a thing as soon as the case of insolvency comes into picture. Yes, and then they have given you, they have explained you, they have given you various provisions about the persons about whom we have just spoken, that is your IBBI. Then they have told you about insolvency professional agencies, then they have told you about insolvency professionals and then about the information utilities and then the adjudicating authority about the same persons about whom we have just discussed now. So you can just read it once. Very clear with this. Yes. Now listen. Now let's get into the process of the chapter. Now in this insolvency, basically, first of all, there is a person who is a defaulting person. Okay. There is a person who is a defaulting person or we can say he has not paid the uh, dues of the creditor. So this person who has done that default, that person is called as the corporate debtor. Okay, that person is called as a corporate debtor. He would have done default with his creditors. Creditors can be of two types. One is financial creditors and the other one is your operation creditor. Okay, financial creditor is a person to whom the financial debt is owned. Okay, and operational creditors is the person or the creditor to whom all the operational debt are owned. Yes, and the person who has not paid the money, that person is called as what? That person is called as the corporate debtor. Okay, the defaulter person is called as a corporate debtor. Now, ma'am, so when will this IBC come into picture? What should be the amount of default if we want this IBC to come into picture? So, amount of default, minimum amount of default is rupees 1 crore. Okay, the limit with that is applicable for your examinations. When you go and check the bare law IBC 2016, there the limit given is 1 lakh rupee. But then central government had, has the powers to increase it up to rupees 1 crore. And this limit from 1 lakh to 1 crore was increased before just at the beginning of your COVID. So now conclusion for the purpose of your examinations, the minimum amount of default that should have been done uh, to initiate IBC is rupees 1 crore. Very, very clear with this. Yes. So, uh, this is how, this is how, uh, or these are the persons who are there under your code. One is your corporate debtor who has done the default. Then you have got your operational creditors and then you have got your financial creditors. 
I hope I am very very clear till here. Yes. Okay. Now listen. Now listen. Who can start the process of insolvency? Okay. It can be suppose if a default has been done with a financial creditor. Let's say for example with a bank. Means a bank has not got its money. A bank had uh, maybe given a loan and the bank has not got the repayment of interest or the bank has not got the repayment of principal etc. Then the case can be started by the insolvency process can be started by the financial creditor. or it can be started by operational creditor example the sundry creditors or uh, the employees workmen etc or the case of insolvency can be started by the corporate debtor himself okay for that particular purpose we have got four sections coming up section number 7 8 9 and 10 okay we have got section number 7 8 9 and 10 which is to be remembered uh which is very very important and which is to be remembered compulsorily section number 7 talks about initiation of cirp by the financial creditor cirp stands for corporate insolvency resolution process this case this process of insolvency can be started as we have discussed it can be started by fc oc or by the corporate debtor himself now when a financial creditor when a financial creditor wants to file a case for insolvency against a corporate debtor this person will go and make an application to the adjudicating uh, authority and uh, along with all the necessary information proof of default then uh, it he will also recommend a name of a insolvency professional as irp irp stands for interim resolution professional who will take ahead the cases of insolvency just like for a court case just like we appoint a lawyer same way here we are appointing a person called as interim resolution professional all these things he will go and submit it to the adjudicating authority that is to the nclt and nclt will consider your application and it will reply it has to uh, check it will take a time period of uh, 14 days and within 14 days it will determine whether there is a default or there is no default if there is a default then it will um accept the application if there is no default then it will reject the application and if there is a de defect in the application then it will give us a time period of 7 days to rectify it and depending upon that the application can be accepted or it can be rejected i hope i am very very clear with this yes so fc you are in the section number 7 who is going to whom fc is going to the adjudicating authority against the corporate debt similarly similarly who else can go and file and make uh, go and make an application application can be filed even by the operational creditor but in that case we have got two section numbers coming up section number 8 and section number 9 one extra process is given in section number 8 what is that extra process let's try to understand that in section number 8 operational creditor a uh, operational creditor before he is going and making an application to the adjudicating authority he will go and submit a demand notice a final demand notice uh, to the corporate debtor where he will give a time period of 10 days to the corporate debtor to reply and to make the payment okay that i am giving you final 10 days notice please make sure that you clear all the payments within this time period of uh 10 days and if you fail to do the payment within a time period of 10 days then in that case i will proceed to the adjudicating authority uh, and uh, initiate the cirp initiate the corporate insolvency resolution process against you now depending upon the fact whether he replies whether he does the payment or not depending upon that the case can be started suppose if we say that at the end of 10 days there was no reply received and there was no payment received then in that case operation creditor can proceed and it can go and file an application before the adjudicating authority for initiating the cirp again he will submit the copy of proof of default copy of invoice copy of demand notice which we had just now issued to the corporate debtor and it may suggest a name it may suggest a name of the it may suggest a name of the interim resolution professional now here i use the word may means it is not mandatory for the operation creditor to suggest the name of the irp in case of uh, financial creditor it was mandatory for the fc to suggest a name of the interim resolution professional very very clear with this now the matter reaches whom now the matter reaches the adjudicating authority again same aa will take a time period of 14 days to assert in the default if there is a default if there is a default then the case application will be admitted and the crp will be started if the application is rejected then uh, we will be getting a 
uh, time period we will be getting a time period of seven days to rectify the application and then accordingly uh, on the basis of the fact whether you have rectified the application or not depending upon that the application can be accepted or rejected i hope i'm very very clear with this yes then we go ahead to the next one uh, that is section number 10 where the application is done by the corporate debtor himself the person who himself was insolvent he goes to the adjudicating authority and says that sir i have done a default with either fc or oc and i will submit all my documents relating to books of accounts financial statements how much amount of default i have done then i will even pass a special resolution where uh, every uh, maximum of the shareholders are approving the fact that yes you can go to the adjudicating authority for uh, initiating the CIRP. Once the application reaches the adjudicating authority, again the process remains the same. AA will take a time period of 14 days. AA will take a time period of 14 days to ascertain the default and then depending upon that, it will either accept or it will reject the application and here also the person who is making an application that is a corporate debtor. Corporate debtor has to make sure that it suggests a name of the interim resolution professional so in case of financial creditor and in case of corporate debtor it is mandatory for the applicant to give a name of the irp whereas in case of operational creditor it was not mandatory okay it was not mandatory for the operational creditor to suggest the name of the interim resolution professional i hope i am very very clear till here yes so till here your basic conceptual part basic uh, basic some some conceptual part of going and making an application to the adjudicating authority comes to an end and now just try to understand the date when the application is admitted the date when the application is admitted by the adjudicating authority by the adjudicating authority that is the date when your cirp commences crp stands for corporate insolvency resolution process that is the day when the crp starts i hope i am very very clear till here yes okay okay so once the application has been filed under section 7 8 9 and 10 let's move ahead to the other provisions now once the application is filed uh, we just discussed that the day on which the application is admitted or the day on which the application is accepted uh, by the adjudicating authority that yes there was a default that is the day when the cirp commences right now uh, once the CIRP commences, uh, there is a particular time period within which the CIRP should come to an end. Okay, the time limit for completion of the process which is given under section number 12. Now, they say that the day when the CIRP commences from that day within a time period of 180 days. Okay, within 180 days, the CIRP should come to an end. And later we will study that suppose if a resolution has been passed by the COC committee of creditors about which we will study subsequently. If a resolution has been passed by COC with a voting of at least 66%, then we can get an extension of further 90 days and that is going to be a one-time extension. So, 180 days plus 90 days, this is the maximum time period within which the CIRP should come to an end. And then there was an amendment some time back that suppose if any uh, legal proceedings were going on against the corporate debtor that is against the defaulter person then there can be a delay in completion of the CIRP then in such cases the CIRP should be completed within a total period of 330 days okay so if there are no legal proceedings then it has to be 180 days plus 90 days and if there are legal proceedings then the CIRP should be completed within a time period of 330 days this is the time period for completion of the CIRP okay now once we have made an application either the fc or the oc or the corporate debtor once they have made an application then the application can be withdrawn first option is aa has not yet accepted our application so we can withdraw it before that by making an application to the adjudicating authority because till now it has not accepted it so we can still go and make an application to the aa that's what we wish to withdraw our application so our application can be withdrawn or suppose if my application has been admitted or has been accepted by the adjudicating authority, can we still withdraw the application which we had made? Answer is yes. We can, uh, suppose if by that time the COC was not formed, AA accepted our application but COC was not formed. So, we can again go and make an application to the AA to withdraw the application. If, if uh, 
coc was formed and if now we want to withdraw our application then in that case then in that case the withdrawal application should be approved by 90 percent of the coc okay just like for extension of time period we required 66 percent voting share for extension for withdrawal of application uh, after the coc has been formed we need approval of 90 percent of voting share very clear with this Yes, so this is how the application can still be withdrawn even if the application was admitted by the adjudicating authority. Okay, now once the application is admitted, after that three things will happen. Okay, first thing a moratorium will start, then the IRP will be appointed and then a public announcement will be done. Okay, so let's do it one by one. First of all, what happens in moratorium or what do you mean by the term called as moratorium? In morat moratorium is nothing but a calm period. Okay, a calm period of 180 days is declared. That 180 relates to the same time period of 180 days. And during this period, all the legal cases, suits, proceedings, etc. will cease. It will stop during this particular period. So that we will give time to that corporate debtor, will give time to that defaulter to resolve its status but achha, during this particular period we cannot go and file means the corporate debtor cannot file a case against anyone else anyone else cannot come and file a suit against the corporate debtor enforcement of property enforcement of security interest in the property example any property is kept as mortgage with the bank it cannot uh, enforce that particular security interest if i have occupied any property as a lesser as a on lease then in that case that person cannot ask me to vacate the property uh, if, if I am paying the rent etc continuous uh, regularly but but the supply of goods and services supply of goods and services if we are doing the payment for that that cannot be terminated during the moratorium and normal business operations can go on okay normal business operations can go on during this moratorium period so legal cases cannot uh, be like we cannot initiate against anyone else anyone else cannot do it against us we cannot sell off our property uh, interest in the asset cannot be enforced security interest cannot be enforced but business can go on during this moratorium period and this moratorium period is basically valid till the time the CIRP is going on okay uh, generally we say that moratorium period is going to be for 180 days but if my time period for completion of CIRP gets extended then even my moratorium is going to get extended okay so moratorium gets implemented right from the day when the CIRP commences then after that uh, as soon as moratorium starts after that we appoint the uh, adjudicating authority appoints the IRP that is interim resolution profession you remember in financial creditor and in corporate debtor we had to compulsorily suggest a name of the IRP so the person whose name was suggested as IRP in the application made under section 7 and under section 10 that person can be appointed as the IRP if there are no disciplinary proceedings going on against that particular person Okay, and if OC has also suggested a name, then we can also appoint that particular person as the IRP. But if OC has not had not suggested any particular name, then in that case, AA will go and make a reference to the uh, IBBI for recommending the IRP's name. And IBBI will recommend a name within a time period of 10 days against whom there are no disciplinary proceedings going on. So this is how, this is how your IRP is appointed and as soon as IRP comes into picture, as soon as the IRP comes into picture, the first thing that it does is within a time period of, within a time period of three days from the date of his appointment, he is supposed to do a public announcement informing the general public that CIRP has started against so and so corporate debtor. I am the IRP for this particular case, then whosoever money is yet to be received from this corporate debtor please submit your claims with us and if you submit any false claim then you will be liable for penalty for that particular case and this public announcement will be given by the IRP within a time period of three days from the date of his appointment right then the IRP uh, now now the IRP comes in now the IRP is there he starts collecting the claims from the general public whosoever money is due. Then he starts taking the control of affairs of business of the corporate debtor. He will start managing the business. He will uh, exercise the powers which were earlier there with the board of directors. He will uh, now deal with the financial institutions of the corporate debtor etc. Okay. Uh, now the first thing that he will do here now is he will constitute a COC. 
okay he will constitute a coc coc stands for uh, committee of creditors committee of creditors as the name suggests it is going to have your uh, all your creditor but as per your ibc committee of creditors is mainly going to have its financial creditors okay if financial creditors are there then all the financial creditors except the related parties of the corporate debtor will form part of the coc okay if there are no financial creditors or if all the financial creditors are related parties then in such a case 18 largest 18 largest operational creditors plus one person representing the workman plus one person representing the employee all these people will be coming and sitting in the committee of creditors okay this is how this is how uh, mainly this is how your coc is formed now uh, once the coc is formed the main purpose the main purpose uh, of first of all forming the coc is as soon as the coc is formed then within a time period of seven days from formation of coc the first meeting of coc is conducted okay this first meeting of coc is called by the irp notice of this meeting will be given to all the uh, all the members of the coc it will be given to the ex management of the corporate debtor even though they come or no that is not uh, relevant but we have to give them the uh, notice that yes this is the first meeting of the coc then you will be giving notice even to the uh, large operational creditors whose debt is more than or equal to 10 percent of the total uh, creditors and uh, these are the people basically these are the people who can come and sit in the first meeting of the committee of creditors and uh, whenever there is a meeting of committee of creditors happening there has to be a quorum of 33 percent 33 percent of the coc even if x management does not come that's absolutely okay but for a proper meeting there should be a quorum of at least 33 percent of the coc if quorum is not there then the meeting gets adjourned to the next day right now in this first meeting of the coc the main purpose of calling this first meeting of coc is to appoint the rp okay this irp can also be uh, appointed as the rp if he gives his consent and if there is a voting of at least 66 percent by the coc then this irp can also be appointed as the rp if we don't want to appoint the same person as the rp then we can go and take a name recommendation from the ibbr and we can appoint a new person as the uh, resolution professional also so basically your appointment of rp is happening either the irp get get converted or he can get appointed as the rp or we can appoint a new person as a resolution professional are you very very clear with this so now so now basically irp is gone from the picture now you have got a person called as rp who is there now he will start with the work okay now what is the main work what was the main purpose of the chapter main purpose of the chapter was to resolve to resolve the uh, corporate debtor to you know to convert him we can say that to make some plan by which his insolvency position can improve and now he can start doing his business so now uh, he will now uh, rp is there in the picture he will take all the handover of documents from the irp if it was a different person it will take the control of books of accounts it will now talk to the financial institutions it will now discuss the matters with the coc and then it will appoint uh, it will do the appointment of persons called as resolution applicants okay these resolution applicants these resolution applicants are uh, some persons who has to fulfill the criteria is given under section number 29a example example that person himself resolution applicant should not be an insolvent person he should not be a willful defaulter his account should not be classified as npa he should not be convicted of any offenses and all those things so resolution applicant is such a person with mastermind who is going to prepare or who is going to suggest some plans and that plans is called as the resolution plans so plan is not prepared by the resolution professional plans are actually prepared by the resolution applicant that is by the mastermind people but for preparing the plan can we say that rp needs some knowledge right for preparation of plan rp needs some uh, rp as well as your resolution applicant needs some knowledge so rp is going to prepare a document called as information memorandum which contains all the important information about the corporate debtor it is going to prepare the document called as information memorandum and it will share this information memorandum with the resolution applicant on the basis of which the resolution applicant is going to prepare the plan 
right now resolution applicants can be one person also it can be multiple persons also they will submit their plan to the resolution professional resolution professional will check whether all the legal requirements have been followed whether payment to all the types of creditors have been considered in the plan whether that plan is a feasible plan or not etc so ra resolution applicant submits the plan to the rp rp does the check of it and then if rp likes the plan he will submit it further before the coc for its approval if coc likes the plan they can approve it by a voting of at least 66 percent and once it is approved by the coc then it has to be submitted to the adjudicating authority and uh, if adjudicating authority likes the plan then the plan gets approved and the cirp comes to an end okay till the time the plan is with the coc you can make multiple plans Okay, till the time it is there with the COC, you can make multiple plans, you can refer it back to the resolution applicant to reconsider it, etc. But once it is submitted to adjudicating authority, there is no going back. If AA approves, then the plan is approved. Okay, means insolvency resolution has approved. Uh, yes, insolvency resolution has happened. But if the plan is rejected by the adjudicating authority, then that is going to lead to liquidation because there is no going back to the resolution applicant. So before you submit the plan to the COC, you have to be very, very careful. You have to be very, very careful that your plan is a foolproof plan. Very, very clear with this. Yes, so now the plan goes to the adjudicating authority. If AA thinks that yes, everything is proper, then in that case, AA will approve the plan and the, it will be binding on everyone. It will be binding on the corporate debtor, its employees, members, creditors, stakeholders, everyone. Very, very clear with this. Achha, on some circumstances, on some circumstances, suppose that the plan was in contravention of any law or there was some irregularity which was done by the resolution professional or if uh, debt of OC, operation creditors is not considered etc. Then in such cases, we can still go and file an appeal before the NCL. AT because the adjudicating authority was the NCLT. If we want to go and file an appeal, then we can go to the NCL AT. Very, very clear with this. Achha, suppose, what if the plan was rejected? What if the plan was rejected by the adjudicating authority? Then in that case, it will lead to liquidation. What if we could not submit a plan within 180 days plus 90 days? Then also we could not complete with the CIRP process. Then in that case, even that will lead to liquidation. What if COC with a voting of 66% says that let's liquidate? We required the 66% voting for approving the plan. But what if they say that with a voting of 66%, let's liquidate the a corporate debtor then we have to liquidate the corporate debtor if they are of the opinion that there is no point in continuing this particular uh, corporate debtor right in such cases it will lead to liquidation okay now when we go for liquidation process when we go for liquidation process first of all adjudicating authority will pass an order for liquidation of the uh, corporate debtor now the coc will dissolve coc will come to an end Okay, whatever powers were there with the management, ex-management, that will now come with the liquidator. So, ma'am, who will be the liquidator here? Either, either the same RP, either the same RP who was doing the CRP process, that person can be appointed as a liquidator or we can take a new name from the IBBI who can be appointed as a liquidator. Very clear with this. So, now liquidator will come into picture. He will exercise his powers. He will fulfill his duties. You know, he will start verifying the claims of the creditors. He will take the custody of all the assets and properties. He will invite and settle the claims of the creditors. He will investigate into the matters. He will, um, you know, uh, check. He will do the valuation of the assets. He will uh, defend the cases on behalf of the corporate debtor. Whatever thing was supposed to be done by the board of directors will now be done by the liquidator. Right? Achha. Now, then he will prepare something called as liquidation estate. Liquidation estate is what? Liquidation estate is basically uh, a pool of all your assets. What all things can be taken uh, in the name of corporate debtor? What all things will not form part of the liquidation estate? So any asset over which we have an ownership right, any asset over which we have ownership right that will be included in our liquidation estate, right? Any asset which is kept in our possession but the ownership does not belong to us that cannot form part of the liquidation estate. Any amounts which were payable to the employees as a part of pension gratuity that cannot be sold. Very clear with this. Yes, then um, any asset which was given as collateral to the creditors over which the creditors have relinquished their rights that now belongs to the corporate debtor that will be considered. 
right and all the other proceeds of liquidation over which the corporate debtor has ownership that will be forming part of your liquidation estate okay but the personal assets of the shareholders personal assets of the partners of the corporate debtor these cannot be considered as a part of liquidation estate because as you know a uh, company is a separate company and llp both both are separate legal entities right if both are separate legal entities then we cannot attach the assets of the shareholders and the partners of the llp shareholders of the company or partners of the llp very very clear with this okay now liquidator once he prepares the liquidation estate after that liquidator will collect the claims uh, as soon as the liquidation process starts he will start collecting the claims he will verify the claims if any creditor wants to alter the claims or withdraw his claims he can do that and then liquidator will finalize that finally how much amount of money is to be paid to which category of creditors right now it's time that we need to make the payment we need to start making the payment to our creditors for that first we will go to the secured creditors okay secured creditors who are having some asset with them so secured creditor first option is secured creditor can relinquish secured creditor can relinquish his security interest he will tell say take my asset and give me my money that is one option alternatively we will tell to the secured creditor you keep the asset with yourself and uh, if there is any surplus you give us the money and if there is any deficit then the liquidator that is we will pay you the money so these are the two options given to the secured creditor do you want to relinquish the secured uh, the security asset or do you want to keep it now once all these things are done after that comes the most important thing i'll just show it to you after that comes the most important thing that is distribution of distribution of assets which is given uh, in section number 100 and uh, which is given in section number 53 okay uh, now, uh, how does this distribution of ha uh, asset happens? That has to be done in a particular sequence. Eight points to be remembered there. First of all, we will pay the insolvency and liquidation process cost in full. Okay, after that, at the second level, two things will be paid in pari pasu or uh, equally. One is workmen dues for the last 24 months, and the next one is secured creditors who have relinquished their securities. These two people will be paid equally at the second level. Then we will pay the wages and other amounts to the employees, wages and other dues to the employees for the last 12 months. Above was your workmen dues, here it is basically to the employees. Then at the fourth level, we are going to pay the paid to the unsecured financial creditors at the fifth level again two people will be paid equally one is to the government for the last two years and the other one is secured creditor in case of any deficit then comes your other creditors then your preference shareholders and then your equity shareholders this is the sequence this is the sequence in which the payment should be done to the uh, in case of liquidation right once the assets have been completely liquidated after that liquidator will go and make an application to the adjudicating authority that sir please pass an order for dissolution the day when the order is passed by the adjudicating authority that will be considered as the date of dissolution and then we will forward the the order will be forward forwarded to the authority with whom we are registered example it will be forwarded to the roc within a time period of seven days of the Okay, and this is how, this is how your liquidation process comes to an end. I hope I am very, very clear. So, suppose if the plan was approved within that 180 days plus 90 days or within 330 days in case of legal proceedings, then well and good. But if it could not be done, then in that case, it will lead to liquidation. Very, very clear with this. Yes. Okay. Now going on to the next two standalone topics which are there under your IBC. One is your first one is your fast track CIRP. Now what is going to be there in your fast track CIRP? Fast track CIRP is just one additional process, one additional option which is given in case of some corporate debtors, some small corporate debtors uh, in which we can go and make an application for CIRP and the process will be speeded up okay now first of all it is going to be applicable in case of which corporate debtors so first of all it has to be a small company in if the corporate debtor is a small company or if corporate debtor is a startup company a startup other than a partnership firm or if it is an unlisted company whose total assets does not exceed rupees 1 crore if these small corporate debtors are there means small defaulters are there then uh, against them fast track CRP can be initiated by the 
or financial creditor, operational creditor, or by the corporate debtor by making an application to the adjudicating authority along with the proof of default and such other information. If fast track CRP is initiated, it is not mandatory, but if we go for fast track CRP, then it has to be completed within a time period of 90 days. Plus, it can be extended by a further period of 45 days if COC approves it by a voting of 75%. And again, this 45 days extension is going to be a one time extension. Very, very clear with this. Yes, so fast track CRP it is not mandatory, but if the corporate debtor falls under those criteria, under this particular criteria, then we may go for fast track CIR. Very, very clear with this. Yes. Okay. Then going on to the next one, that is your voluntary liquidation of corporate persons. Okay. Voluntary liquidation of corporate persons. Now, uh, your corporate persons means we are specifically talking only about, only about companies first of all. If a company wants to liquidate itself in cases of other than insolvency, okay, whatever we have been studying till now, here we have been discussing only about insolvency cases. Here normally if any particular company wants to close it itself down, then it can do so under section 59 of the IBC. And uh, there is a particular process given for that. If we want to initiate this voluntary liquidation, then a declaration, then a declaration should be submitted from majority of the directors that they have inquired into the full state of the business affairs of that particular uh, corporate person and the company is not uh, and the company is a solvent company and it is not getting liquidated to defraud any particular person means we are here the most important thing is the person who wants to get voluntarily liquidated should not be an insolvent person it wants to close down for cases other than insolvency along with this declaration we have to attach the audited financial statements for the last two years and we have to take a report from the registered valuer showing that uh, see these are the valuation of assets and liabilities and our company is a solvent company right now once you have taken the declaration from majority of the directors from that day within a time period of four weeks we have to take we have to pass a special resolution that is to be passed by the members of that particular company that they simply want to close down the business operations or a resolution has to be passed by the members of the company that the period which was mentioned in the aoa of the company has got over now so that's the reason we want to close down our company or Suppose if AOA had provided some other condition or some other event that on happening of this particular event, on happening of this particular event, the company will dissolve. And now that event has happened, then um, we have to uh, write there that, okay, so and so event has happened. That's the reason the company is going for liquidation. Very, very clear with this. Yes, and uh, as soon as this particular resolution is passed from that day within a time period of seven days the company will notify company will notify to the roc and to the ibbi that we have passed we have taken the declaration from the directors and also we have passed a resolution the date when the resolution was passed the date when the special resolution was passed that was the date when the liquidation proceedings have commenced okay now once the liquidation proceedings commence after that again we are going to sell off our assets we are going to pay off our liabilities and once that thing is done then the liquidator will make an application to the aa that sir everything is over please pass a dissolution order the date when the dissolution order is passed that will be considered as the date of dissolution and then we will inform it to the registered authority within a time period of 14 Okay, this is how, this is how your voluntary liquidation process comes to an end. I hope I am very, very clear with this everyone. Yes, and then you have got some preferential transactions, undervalued transactions, extortionate credit transaction. Just go through it once, not very important, but just to be read once. And for the pre-packaged insolvency resolution process, I have already uploaded a separate video for that. The link for which uh, I will be putting uh, in the YouTube description section. And I have already done it for the amendment videos. I have already put it in the description of my amendment videos, etc. also. So, pre-packaged insolvency resolution process can be referred from there.
okay so these were whatever things we have revised here in the chapter these were your conceptual provisions okay these were your conceptual provisions minimum things that you have to remember for the purpose of this ibc chapter and then in the super quick revision uh, charts i have put almost all the important provisions you can just revise it read it from the textbook once i hope i am very very clear with this everyone Okay, so let's start with a super quick revision of the next chapter that is the SEBI Act 1992. Let's start with it. Now, first of all, uh, what are the objectives? What are the main objectives? What is the main purpose of formation of this particular law? So, most three important objectives here is to protect the interest of investors who are going to deal in the securities market, then to promote the development of the securities market and to regulate the securities market so that it is going on in a fair manner or whatever transactions happen here in the securities market are done in a fair manner okay for this particular purpose first of all the chapter is very very simple okay uh, now for the purpose of this act they had established a board called as the sebi sebi uh, full form what is the full full form obviously ma'am we know now uh, this sebi was established as what this was established as a body corporate so it is going to have a perpetual succession it is going to have a common seal it can hold property in its own name it can sue any other person or it can be sued by any other person and sebi is going to have some members sebi management i am talking about it is going to have some members within it uh, that has a chairperson then it has two members from the officials of the central government one person from the officials of the rbi and five other members who are nominated by the central government out of whom at least three of them should be full time members this is this is uh, how the management of the sebi looks like okay now the people who are sitting here in the management of the sebi let's talk about their um, uh, qualifications and let's talk about their tenure so they say that the chairperson of the sebi okay chairperson of sebi and every whole time member chairperson and every whole time member of the sebi if they are coming into sebi they are going to hold their office for a period for one term of five years and maximum up to 65 years of age and once their one term gets over after that they can be reappointed but maximum they can act as up to 65 years of age Age. okay and obviously they should not be financially interested into sebi because that leads to lack of independence okay and these people should be some people with ability knowledge integrity experience and all those things Achha, can the central government can the central government remove these particular people from the management of the sebi answer is yes definitely chair uh, the chairperson and five other members the five uh, last five members who were nominated by the central government uh, those members can be removed by the central government either we can remove them immediately by giving them three months salary and allowances or we can give them a three months notice now that you will be you will uh, you will have to leave the office after a period of three months okay so this is the way in which their removal can be done now similarly similarly can these people also say that we want to leave the management of the sebi definitely yes they can give a written notice to the central government of three months and then they can uh, relinquish their office okay so one was above point was talking about removal and this one is talking about your resignation kind of a thing Achha, now for removal we had seen two methods what were the two methods of removal either those can be removed today itself by paying them three months salary and allowances or we can tell them that uh, we'll give, give you three months notice in writing and you will have to relinquish your office after a period of three months but for what reasons for what reasons these people can be removed these people can be removed if they are adjudicated as an insolvent person or if they are declared by the court to be of unsound mind or if they have convicted of any convicted any convict if they are convicted of any offense involving moral turpitude or if they have abused made wrong use of their position then in that case after giving a reasonable opportunity of being heard those people can be removed from the management of the set okay and if these people now since sebi is there sebi is basically a board there which is going to run the entire uh, securities market so sebi is going to conduct meeting from time to time and any person who has got any interest in that particular meeting direct or indirect interest in that particular meeting then in that case that person will disclose his interest and he will not take part in any of such discussions in the sebi's meeting very very clear with this 
yes now going on to section number 11 as you can see here uh, section number 11 talks about powers and functions of the SEBI. This is a very general answer but a little lengthy answer which we will divide into small small parts. Now first of all in powers and functions of the SEBI, first let's talk about duty of the SEBI. Okay, three most important uh, objectives of the act to protect the interest of the investors, then to regulate the securities market and to promote the development of the securities market. These three are also the duties of the SEBI. Okay, then there are there are few powers, few specific powers which are there only with the SEBI. Now SEBI is going to regulate the working of the stock exchanges, recognized stock exchanges. It will prohibit insider trading. It will collect fees for providing services. Then it can even call for information. It will prohibit the fraudulent activities. It will prohibit the uh, unfair trade practices, etc. These are specifically whose powers? These are specifically your SEBI's power. Along with that, SEBI also has got the power to conduct inspection of books of accounts of any particular person who is coming under the purview. Uh, like example, it can do the inspection of books of accounts of stock exchanges of any listed company, proposed to be listed company, etc. But you can touch or you can do the inspection of books of accounts of any listed company or proposed to be listed company only if the SEBI has got the reasons to believe that the, that particular company is indulged in insider trading or fraudulent and unfair trade practices. See, whenever you're going and inspecting the books of accounts of a listed company or proposed to be listed company, that is a big thing. So that can be done only if we have got the reasons to believe that such companies indulge into insider trading practices. Okay, then SEBI, we had discussed this in previous chapter also. SEBI has got all the powers as vested in a civil court. Yes, Acha. Now, SEBI also has got, we'll study further also. SEBI also, after doing inspection, it also has got the powers to do investigation. Okay, once either do, when the investigation is going on or once the investigation is completed, SEBI also has the powers. SEBI also has the powers to suspend the trading, suspend the trading in the recognized stock exchange. It can uh, prohibit some person in trading into securities market, it can stop any, restrain any person from accessing the securities market, it can remove any member from the recognized stock exchanges, it can attach the bank account which was involved in uh, this violation of the uh, provisions of the SEBI, it can attach such bank accounts etc. These are, these are specifically, these are some specific powers which can be exercised by the SEBI when the investigation is going on or after the investigation has been completed. Yes. Okay. Then whenever, whenever any particular company wants to raise money from the general public, it is mandatory for that particular company to issue prospectus or any offer document. Right. So now, so now here in such cases, in such cases, uh, in that particular prospectus, we already have in our companies act what all things should be there in the contents of the prospectus. Along with that, along with the provisions of the companies act, SEBI can also specify by regulations what all things are to be disclosed in that particular prospectus specifically or what all things or it can also specify by way of a general order or by a special order that if for example, for example, if a telecom company is coming up with a public issue, what extra things are to be disclosed in the prospectus? So a common thing which is to be followed by every company that is already given in the Companies Act. What extra things is to be disclosed in the prospectus can be specified by the SEBI by way of SEBI regulations or by passing of any order. Very clear with this? Yes. Okay. Then after that, after that, um, uh, uh, in section number 11b, section number 11b talks about powers of the SEBI to issue directions and to levy penalty. Now SEBI can issue directions on whom? SEBI can issue directions on any person who is covered under section number 12. Ma'am, who all are covered under section number 12? Example, recognized stock exchanges are covered, mutual funds are covered, REITs are covered, invits are covered, then your uh, stock brokers are covered, other intermediaries are covered, underwriters are covered, investment advisors are covered. All these people who somewhere, you know, are related to the securities market, all these people are coming under section number 12. Means if they want to function for the securities market, they have to first obtain registration from the SEBI under section number 12. So can SEBI levy directions on these particular persons? Can it issue directions on these persons? Definitely answer is 
yes plus sebi can also levy penalty or it can also issue directions on a listed company or a proposed to be listed company also okay but when will it issue directions to if it wants to protect the interest of the investors if it want to prevent the affairs if it wants to prevent some wrongful affairs which are being going on in a detrimental manner or whenever it wants to secure proper management whenever it wants to make sure that everything should go on smoothly for that purpose sebi can say that do this way do that way do this do that etc and whenever sebi issues directions it is mandatory for the other person to listen to those directions also very very clear with this acha plus along with this sebi automatically by default goes without saying sebi also has the power to uh, issue penalty levy penalties on these particular persons if they are contravening any of the provisions of the law and if someone has done the contravention of the law and earned wrongful profit out of it then that can be confiscated also that can be seized also very very clear with this this is given under section number 11b and now going on to the next section that is section number 11c which talks about power of sebi to order investigation before investigation we just studied about inspection also does sebi have the power to do the inspection yes definitely sebi can do the inspection sebi can do inspection but whenever whenever it is doing inspection of a listed company or a proposed to be listed company it can do only if we have reasons to believe that it is involved in insider trading or fraudulent or unfair trade practice Okay, now once the inspection is done, after that, if it wants to go into detail of any particular thing, can it even go for investigation? Answer is yes, it can even go for investigation if it is of the opinion that some transactions are done which are done in detrimental manner, or it has violated some terms and conditions, or it has violated some provisions, then it can go for investigation also. Right for this purpose, SEBI will appoint an authority called as investigating authority, who is going to uh, do the investigation of the books of accounts of that particular person. Okay, for the purpose, for the purpose of investigation, that particular authority can preserve, can take the books of accounts into its custody for a period of six months. It also has the powers to do the examination on oath. right it can after questioning it will also take the notes on notes of examination that what all questions were asked and what all answers were given for that particular question acha if during investigation if the authority comes to know that the that particular person can alter the books of accounts destroy falsify mutilate the books of accounts then then investigating authority will go and make an application to the magistrate or to the special court for seizure of books of accounts and once the permission is allowed by the magistrate it can even seize the books of accounts and it will not return till the time the investigation is completed if one six months we had studied just now that six months was normally whenever it wants to do investigation then for the purpose of investigation it can take the books of accounts into its custody for a period of six months but if suppose uh, during investigation if there is a doubt that they can alter the books falsify mutilate or destroy etc then in such cases it can uh, take the approval for the seizure order and if seizure of books of accounts is done then the books of accounts is to be returned at the end of the till the time the investigation goes on very very clear till your everyone yes okay so this was mainly talking about what this was mainly talking about your investigation before this we had studied about in powers of sebi we had studied about inspection but in 11 c we studied mainly about the investigation okay then going on to the next section in this series that is section number 11d section number 11d talks about what section number 11d talks about seize and desist proceeding seize means sebi if sebi is of the opinion that we have violated any terms and conditions provisions of acts rules etc then sebi can pass an order on us that please stop doing it pass the seize order please stop doing this violation please don't do this again and it will also pass a desist order which will say that please do not involve into this thing again means do not repeat it seize means to stop and desist means not to repeat it again but this order can be passed this order can be passed on a listed company or a proposed to be listed company only if it is involved in insider trading or market manipulation so did you see some benefits have been given to listed company and proposed to be listed company that if any such like inspection order is to be passed seize or desist order is to be passed then you cannot simply pass those orders on them you have to make sure or you should be having reasonable 
um, uh, you should be having reasons to believe that that company is involved in insider trading or market manipulation or fraudulent or unfair trade practices then only such actions or such uh, orders can be passed on any listed company or proposed to be listed company very very clear with this yes then uh, section number 12 we had already seen this talks about the registration certificate means the people who are coming under the purview the people who are coming under the purview of sebi example i had given you was of stock exchanges stock brokers intermediaries merchant bankers underwriters portfolio manager investment advisors reit mutual funds your venture capital collective investment scheme alternate investment scheme etc these people are dealing into security so before they start dealing into securities uh, before that they have to get themselves registered they have to obtain a registration certificate from the sebi yes and once they have obtained the registration certificate from the sebi then after that it comes under the purview of sebi and sebi has got the powers to issue directions and to levy penalty on such persons right okay then after that going on to the next part of the chapter which talks about finance accounts and audit this is your procedural part in finance accounts and audit first of all how does the sebi function uh, now sebi was in the form of a body corporate so sebi for the purpose of managing its activities sebi is going to establish a fund called as sebi general fund okay it is going to establish a fund called as sebi general fund the main inflow in the sebi general fund is going to be by way of fees which it is going to collect by issuing the registration certificates etc and mainly in the form of grants mainly in the form of grants from the uh, central government and this money will be utilized for paying off all the expenses of the SEBI for meeting the salary allowances of the SEBI and for uh, objects for fulfilling the objects of the SEBI for this particular purpose the SEBI general fund was established now talking about the books of accounts of the SEBI SEBI is also required to maintain its books of accounts right SEBI is also required to maintain its books of accounts uh, in consultation with the CAG annual accounts of uh, accounts will be annual statement of accounts will be maintained and this will be this will be audited by the CAG and audit expense will obviously be borne by the SEBI once the audit has been completed after that the certified accounts will be forwarded to the central government and central government will lay it down before both the houses of parliament I hope I am very very clear till here. Yes. Let's go ahead to the penalties part under the SEBI Act. Let's start with it. There are going to be three sections which we have to compulsorily remember out of the entire list of penalties that has been given. At least these three sections to be remembered. Section number 15A, section number 15F and section number 15G. Okay. First of all, let's do section number 15A, the first section. Uh, this penalty is applicable if any particular person was asked by SEBI to furnish any information to file any particular return uh, and if that person fails to furnish the information or if he fails to or if he gives the incomplete information or if he fails to file the return within the specified time period etc then that person will be liable to a penalty minimum rupees 1 lakh which can go up to 1 lakh per day okay 1 lakh per day but maximum up to rupees 1 crore this is the maximum penalty that is going to be applicable there yes so minimum 1 lakh maximum 1 lakh per day but maximum limit cap up to rupees 1 crore okay this is the amount this is the amount of penalty that is leviable under section number 15a right now going on to the next section that we have to remember there is section number 15f 15f is generally such a type of section on which we get direct questions okay we get direct questions there section number 15 f penalty in case of stock brokers now uh, in that basically there are three sub penalties which are coming under section 15 f the first one being if the stock broker fails to issue the contract note in specific form okay if it fails to issue the contract note in specific form then the amount of penalty is Minimum rupees 1 lakh, maximum rupees 1 crore for each such default. Minimum 1 lakh, maximum rupees 1 crore. Okay. Second type of sub penalty that is coming up here is if that particular broker, if we have purchased any securities, but if he has failed to deliver us the security or if we have sold any securities, but he has failed to make the payment to us of the sale consideration to us, 
then the amount of penalty is going to be same as that of section number 15a that is minimum rupees 1 lakh which can go up to 1 lakh per day and maximum up to rupees 1 crore okay so first one was uh, for the purpose of non-issuing of contract note in specified form second one is if they fail to deliver us the security or if they fail to make us the payment and the last one if any of the stock broker if any of the stock broker is charging excessive amount of brokerage, then the penalty that will be leviable on that particular stock broker is 1 lakh or 5 times the amount of excessive brokerage charge. 1 lakh or 5 times the amount of excessive brokerage charge, whichever is higher. Okay. So, uh, whenever you get a question, generally on this particular time, you, on this particular time, you get a direct question state the penalties that is applicable for all the stock brokers. So, directly you have to write section number 15. Yeah. I hope I am very very clear till here. Yes. And then the next one that is section number 15G. Just below that as you can see here. Section number 15G which talks about your insider trading. Right. Now, in this case if there is any particular person who has got some unpublished price sensitive information and if that person does trading on the basis of that unpublished price uh, unpublished uh, price sensitive information or if he uh, you know if he is able to counsel someone else to deal into securities on the basis of that information then these people will be held guilty for the punishment of dealing or trading in trading by the way of insider trading and the penalty that is applicable for section number 15g is minimum rupees 10 lakh okay which can go up to 25 crore 25 crore or three times the profit earned out of insider trading out of these two whichever is higher out of these two means out of 25 crore or three times the profit made out of insider trading whichever is higher this is the amount of penalty that is applicable for insider trading Yes, so these three sections, section 15A, section 15F and section 15G, these three sections you have to remember mandatory. Yes, okay. So this was all about, at least these three penalties you have to remember, uh, these three important penalties we have done. Now going on to the next section that is section number 15I, 15I talks about power to adjudicate. Now these penalties have been given by the act. But who is going to determine the amount of penalty? Like at many places we have got the range of penalty etc. So who determines this amount of penalty? So for the purpose of penalties that we have studied, for that purpose SEBI appoints a person called as adjudicating officer who is going to determine, who will give us a reasonable opportunity of being heard and it will find out whether you are actually guilty of that particular thing or not and then that particular person is going to determine the amount of penalty for that particular purpose uh, adjudicating officer can call you it can call certain information from you and all those things and after that adjudicating officer is going to pass the order very very clear with this yes okay now listen at at places where we have got the range of penalty example at one of the places we had got minimum rupees 1 lakh which can go up to rupees 1 crore remember that Minimum rupees 1 lakh, maximum up to rupees 1 crore. So, now this is a range. So, now will, will lesser amount of penalty be applicable or will higher amount of penalty be applicable? What will be the scenario? So, that depends on certain factors. It, that does not depend upon the mood of the adjudicating officer. That depends upon certain factors. Like example, how much amount of loss was caused to the investors? What is the amount of gain that has been made by that particular defaulter person by contravening the provision? Is it the first time that person has done the default or he is doing it repeatedly, right? Depending upon such factors, the adjudicating officer will determine the amount of penalty. I hope I am very, very clear till here. Yes, and whatever penalty is collected by the adjudicating officer here, all the penalty goes to an account called as Consolidated Fund of India. Must be remembered, maybe for MCQ purposes, etc., all uh, any penalties which are collected will be credited to the account called as consolidated fund of india very very clear with this yes okay now uh, another thing yes whenever uh, you know penalties have been initiated or penalty order has been passed by the adjudicating officer etc then the accused person can go and make an application to the sebi 
okay for that the procedure has been given by the sebi uh, sebi considering the nature of the default the gravity of the default the amount involved in the default etc it will it may accept your application for settlement okay it may accept your application for settlement settlement means your penalty amount can be reduced there and whatever is the lesser amount of penalty that will be collected from us now after settlement the amount will be reduced so whatever is the reduced amount of penalty that will be collected from us that will also go to the consolidated fund of india just like your penalties was also going to consolidated fund of india similarly even this will be the settled amount is also nothing but lesser amount of penalties right even this will go to the consolidated fund of india very very clear with this yes now just like in the previous chapters also we had these appeal provisions similarly in sebi also we have got the appeal provisions for that purpose we have established an authority called as sat 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 stands for securities appellate tribunal okay just like we had appellate tribunal in the pmla chapter also here we are going to have securities appellate tribunal so ma'am who all are going to come and sit in the securities appellate tribunal you are going to have a head called as presiding officer then you are going to have some number of judicial members and you are going to have some number of technical members sitting within this particular sat these are the total number of members head of the sat is called as a presiding officer then you have some judicial members you have some technical members then after that then after that uh generally whatever cases goes to the sat that, that is whatever appeal cases goes to the sat generally that is handled by a bench okay bench and bench generally consists of two persons one judicial member and one technical member suppose if there is a dispute between this judicial and technical member then in that case the matter will be referred to the presiding officer and then uh, we are going to take a revised majority i hope i am very very clear with this yes i hope you are able to recollect because this is not the first time that you are studying now then uh, let's talk about the qualifications of these members of the sat okay first let's talk about the presiding officer who is eligible to become a presiding officer so any person who is or who was judge of the supreme court or chief justice of high court or judge of high court for a period of 7 years what did i say judge of supreme court chief justice of high court or judge of high court for a period of Seven years. That person, either he is or he was, then that person, then that person is eligible to become a presiding officer. Okay. Now let's talk about the judicial member who is eligible to become a judicial member. So any person who is or who was a judge of high court for a period of five years, judge of high court for a period of five years. Above it was judge of high court for a period of seven years. right so your judge of high court who is who or who was then that particular person is eligible to become a judicial member similarly for a technical member any person who is or who was a secretary or additional secretary secretary or additional secretary in the department of central government or state government that person can be appointed as a technical member or any person who is a person of proven ability integrity knowledge experience of at least 15 years 15 15 15 years in the financial sector securities market etc then that person is also having the subject knowledge so that person is eligible to become a technical member okay so first qualifications we studied for the presiding officer then we studied for the uh, judicial member and then we studied for the technical member very very clear with this yes now just try to understand whenever these people are appointed okay whenever these people are appointed they are appointed for a specific tenure just like those chairperson of the sebi etc they were appointed for a term of 5 years and max up to 65 years of age similarly here members of the sat they can be appointed for a period of 5 years then they can be reappointed for another period of 5 years but maximum they can act is up to 70 years of age in members of sebi it was 65 years of age here it is 70 years of age so 5 plus 5 and maximum up to 70 years of age very very clear with this acha now can these people be removed or can these people resign just like we had studied for the sebi members also yes so these members can resign by giving a notice to the central government in writing and they have to continue in their office means they have to give first of all at least 3 months notice in writing or they have to continue or they have to continue till 
their successor enters upon the office or they have to continue till their tenure gets over whichever is earlier. So either three months from the date of notice or till the successor enters upon the office or till my tenure gets over whichever is earlier. Very, very clear till here. Yes. So for uh, if in case they are resigning, then this is the time period till which they have to serve in the office. Very, very clear with this. Yes. And then going on to removal part. That is, can these members of SAT also be removed by the central government? Answer is yes. They can very well be removed by the central government. But only after an inquiry has been made by the judge of Supreme Court. If, if that particular person is adjudged as an insolvent or if that person is physically or mentally incapable or if that person is guilty of any offense involving moral turpitude or if that person has abused his position or if that person has acquired financial interest. For any of these reasons, normal, uh, normal reasons, right? Insolvency, physically or mentally incapable, convicted of any offense, abused his position, acquired financial interest, etc. Then there's no point keeping that person sitting in the sad there and that's the reason that person can be removed after giving a reasonable opportunity of being heard. Okay, here the removal is immediate removal. Remember in the first part of the chapter, we had studied for removal of the members of the SEBI. For them, it was either they will be removed today with three months salary and allowances or they will be removed after a period of three months. No such condition is applicable for the members of SAT. Very, very clear with this. Yes. Now listen, now just try to understand. Uh, we just studied about the constitution. Okay, we just studied about the constitution of SAT. Now, let's talk about the main thing that is appeal to the SAT. Now, if we are, if we are aggrieved by any order passed by the SEBI or if we are aggrieved by any order passed by the adjudicating authority, etc., then we can go and file an appeal before the SAT within a time period of 45 days and this delay can be condoned if there is a sufficient cause. Now, the decision will be taken by the SAT. SAT can confirm, modify or set aside this particular order and SAT should try to dispose it of as expeditiously as possible, as fast as possible and should try to dispose it of within a time period of 6 months. Okay, so 45 days plus any number of days as delay and uh, it should try to dispose it of within a time period of 6 months and just, yes, just remember SAT also has got all the powers as vested in a civil court. If we do not know how to represent our case before the SAT, then we can appoint a legal representative for that particular purpose. Okay. Now, if we are again aggrieved by the order given, by the appeal decision given by the SAT, then the last level of appeal is before the Supreme Court. If you are going to the Supreme Court, then you can definitely go only on the matters involving question of law you can go within a time period of 60 days plus delay can be condoned for a maximum period of 60 days. And this is the last level. This is the last level of appeal that is possible. I hope I am very very clear till here. Yes, these were, these were some important provisions. Uh, like till appeal we have completed uh, till here. Now listen, just try to understand. Do you recollect this special quotes etc coming up there? Yes. Now, uh, whenever penalties come into picture, those penalties are levied by whom? Penalties are levied by the adjudicating officer. But if there is a case of punishment, imprisonment or fine, if there is any such punishment given under the SEBI law, not necessary that it is there in our syllabus only. But if there is any punishment under the SEBI law, for that particular purpose, special courts are going to come into picture. Okay, special court will take cognizance, special court will take the note of that particular offense when a complaint has been filed by central government, state government, SEBI, recognized stock exchange, etc. Whenever central government, state government, SEBI, RSC, whenever they come to know about any particular such default, they will go and file the complaint with the special court. Spe special court will take a note of the same, it will take cognizance of that particular offense and then the case will be tried, the case will be solved by the jurisdictional special court. So, special court is going to do speedy trial of offences, right? Same special court was also solving the cases of PMLA in the previous chapter. I hope I am very very clear till here. 
and then one of the common provision here what if the contravention is done by the company if the contravention is done by the company then in such a case who will be held guilty the person in charge who was there at the time when the offense was done that person will be held guilty but if that person proves that it happened without his knowledge or he had exercised due diligence to prevent such offense then in such case that person won't be liable very very clear till here yes now listen uh, recovery of amount there is something called as recovery of amount now if there is any particular person who fails to pay the penalty that was imposed under the law then there is a person called as recovery officer he is going to issue a recovery certificate where the amount will be returned that how much amount is, is to be recovered from so and so person and it can be recovered by selling our movable property immovable property attaching the bank account and all those things by using those methods the amount can be penalty amount can be recovered from such person okay now just to avoid the payment of penalty if i have transferred my property or if i have transferred my bank account balance to my spouse or to my minor child or to my son's wife or to my son's minor child to any of those people to my spouse to my minor child to my son's uh, minor child or to my son's wife if I have transferred my properties or if I have transferred that my bank balance to such people so that uh, I can show as if no amount is available with me to make the penalty payment then in that case the penalty can be recovered from those people also because it is a clear case that you have just transferred the amount or you have just transferred the property to those people just because you wanted to avoid the penalty payment so it can be recovered from those people also I hope I am very very clear with this and just like we had done the cases of uh, death and insolvency in case of PMLA, that the case does not come to an end, the case is going to continue. Same provisions are applicable in case of SEBI also. Yes, so these were, these were some of your important, most important provisions of SEBI Act that we have covered. I hope I am very, very clear till here everyone. Yes. And then at the end of the act, you have been given the time period for appeal and the most important penalties which are coming up. I hope I am very, very clear till here. Yes. Okay. Okay, so let's start with the next part of SEBI, that is the SEBI LODR regulations 2015. Uh, first of all, full form of LODR, LODR stands for Listing Obligations and Disclosure Requirements, uh, which is applicable. As you already know, SEBI LODR provisions are applicable to whom? It is applicable to all the listed entities which have listed any of those securities on the recognized stock exchange. It can be in form of equity shares, it can be in form of debentures, it can be in form of any other securities, debt instruments, zero coupon bonds and all those things. Right? Now, uh, for the purpose of our syllabus, we have got certain regulations coming up for our syllabus. Let's try to have a look on the most important regulations which are there. First of all, let's talk about regulation number 6. Regulation number 6 talks about regulation number 6 of SEBI. LODR regulations 2015. Regulation number 6 talks about the a person called as compliance officer. As the name suggests, this compliance officer is nothing but the qualified company secretary. And this person... Uh, as you already know, he is responsible for all the compliances which are applicable for the listed entity, for all the coordinations which are happening in the company, between the company and between the board of the company or and uh, uh, company and the SEBI also. And uh, this person ensures that whatever things are happening in the company, whatever procedures are happening in the company or whatever procedures are applicable to the company, those have been correctly followed and lastly and most importantly it this person is also going to monitor the email address of the grievance redressal division grievance redressal division means a division which addresses the grievances of all the uh, security holders so that email address whether like whatever emails have come have those been addressed or not etc even that that is looked after by this qualified cs also called as the compliance officer so, this is the responsibility given to the compliance officer as per the SEBI LODR regulations 2015, right? Then after that, going to the next one, that is regulation number 24, which is kind of important for you. Regulation number 24 talks about corporate governance requirement. Corporate governance requirement with respect to 
unlisted subsidiary of a listed entity. See, we already know that SEBI LODR is applicable to all the listed entity. But what if a listed entity has a subsidiary which is unlisted? Then with respect to that particular subsidiary, what are the requirements which has to be followed by the listed entity? Those are given in regulation number 24. Let's try to understand that and let's try to recollect that. Okay, now first requirement, first requirement which comes up in regulation number 24 is at least one person who has been appointed as independent director on the board of listed entity, the main entity, listed entity shall also become a director in the unlisted material subsidiary. If one person is appointed as an independent director in the listed entity, that person should be appointed as a director in the board of unlisted material subsidiary. Ma'am, unlisted subsidiary we understand. What do you mean by material subsidiary? So, for the purpose of this regulation, the meaning of the term called as material subsidiaries, any such subsidiary who, uh, whose share of income in the total income of the group is more than 20%. Means this particular subsidiary contributes more than 20% of the consolidated income or the subsidiary's net worth is more than 20% of the consolidated net worth, net worth. Then in that case, this particular subsidiary is called as the material subsidiary. Okay, so one requirement of having a common director in both listed as well as the unlisted material subsidiary. Acha, same way, you must have heard about this audit committee. Audit committee reviews the financial statements of the listed company and it should also review uh, the especially a particular point that is investments made by the subsidiary company. Okay, while reviewing, while reviewing the financials of the listed entity, it should also review the investments made by the subsidiary company. Similarly, similarly, whenever the meetings are happening in the subsidiary, unlisted subsidiary company, minutes of those meetings should be placed in the, in the meeting of the board of directors of the listed entity. Basically, what are they trying to do, you know? Whenever you are keeping a watch on the listed entity, at the same time also keep a watch on unlisted subsidiaries. Right? Achha. Similarly, whatever significant transactions are undertaken by the unlisted subsidiary, those transactions should be brought to notice to the board of the listed entity. Means whatever important transactions are happening in the unlisted subsidiary, that should be brought in front of the listed entity also. Very, very clear with this. Yes. And then two most important pointers which are coming up here is whenever a listed entity, whenever a listed entity, if suppose it is disposing of, it is selling of its stake in the material subsidiary, selling of its stake in the material subsidiary and because of that, its shareholding is going to go to less than or equal to 50%. Means now onwards, it is no longer going to be a subsidiary. As of now, I have an unlisted material subsidiary. Now, I am reducing the stake in that material subsidiary because of which my shareholding is going to less than or equal to 50%. Then, that has to be done only by passing a special resolution in the general meeting. Okay, that can be done only by passing a special resolution in the general meeting. Uh, but in two cases, but in two cases, even if you don't pass a special resolution, that is okay. First one is when this scheme was approved by any court or tribunal or whenever this scheme was approved under IBC or when it was forming a part of resolution plan under IBC and because of that the stake is getting reduced. So in such cases, so in such cases, in these two cases passing of SR is not required. In all the other cases, if the stake is getting reduced, if we are reducing our stake in the material subsidiary to less than or equal to 50%, then we have to pass a special resolution in our general meeting. Very clear with this? And the last point, whenever, whenever the unlisted material subsidiary is selling off its assets of more than 20%, of more than 20% of its total asset, then in that case, SR has to be passed in the general meeting of the listed entity. In two cases, SR is not required. One is when the scheme has been approved or when the this transaction has been approved by any court or tribunal or whenever this was approved under a IBC plan. Are you clear with this? 
yes these are some important corporate governance requirement which has to be followed by every listed entity in respect of its unlisted subsidiary very very clear till here everyone yes regulation number 24 you can mark it as important you can get a question on regulation number 24 okay then going on to the quarterly compliances everyone come to the quarterly compliances which has to be followed by every listed entity let's try to understand this quarterly compliances now first of all there is something called as in regulation number 13 sub regulation number 3 there is something called as grievance redressal mechanism okay grievance redressal mechanism that is every listed company will have to file with the stock exchange a statement which shows for every quarter how many grievances are pending at the beginning of the year plus how many new complaints are received during the quarter minus how many complaints have been resolved during the quarter and how many complaints are pending at the end of the quarter a statement showing this has to be filed by every listed company to the recognized stock exchange within 21 days from the end of the quarter okay within 21 days from the end of each quarter this is the quarterly compliance which has to be fulfilled by every listed company very clear with this Achha. then for other things there is something called as other corporate governance requirement for which a specific format is given listed entity will have to submit a quarterly compliance report within 21 days from the end of its from the end of every quarter right so first one was for grievance redressal mechanism second one second one is for other corporate governance requirement third one is for the shareholding pattern every listed company should submit one day before its listing okay one day before it gets listed it has to submit its shareholding pattern because after listing definitely the shareholding pattern is going to change because some number of shares are going to come to the general public in the form of free float so uh, one day before the listing then after listing every time on quarterly basis within 21 days from the end of the quarter and whenever there is a change whenever there is any capital restructuring and which has led to a change of more than 2% of the paid up share capital then within 10 days of such capital restructuring one was one day prior to listing then on regular basis on quarterly basis within 21 days from the end of the quarter and third one is whenever there was a capital restructuring because of which there is a change of a change in the share capital of more than 2% of the paid up share capital then within 10 days inform it inform this uh, about the change in the shareholding pattern i hope i'm very very clear till here everyone yes and uh, yes so these were the most three most important quarterly compliances which every listed company which every listed company has to comply okay similarly similarly whenever a listed company is conducting a board meeting okay whenever a listed company is conducting a board meeting before conducting the board meeting it just has to give the intimation to the recognized stock exchange a prior intimation of board meeting should be given to the recognized stock exchange when whenever we are conducting the board meeting for the following circumstances okay whenever we are conducting the board meeting to consider the financial results then at least five days before the board meeting go and inform it go and inform that we are going to conduct a board meeting to the recognized stock exchange how many days in advance five days in advance before the meeting inform it to the recognized stock exchange okay okay then whenever you are going to conduct a board meeting for declaration of bonus of a proposal of buyback or for recommendation of dividend or for fpo etc then in such cases for these things you have to first conduct a board meeting so at least two days before the board meeting at least two clear days before the board meeting inform about it to the recognized stock exchange that we are going to conduct a board meeting for so and so matters okay then similarly whenever you're going to alter the interest rates okay whenever you're going to alter the interest rates, example in case of bonds or debentures or whenever you're going to alter the rights of the security holders inform at least 11 days before to the rse that you're going to alter it I hope you are understanding this yes the thing that we studied on the previous page that was quarterly compliances that we were submitting to the recognized stock exchange and here we are not submitting anything to the RAC we are just informing the RAC that we are going to conduct a board meeting for so and so reasons I hope you are very very clear with this yes 
ओके देन गोइंग अहेड टू द टाइप ऑफ कमिटीज फॉर टाइप ऑफ कमिटीज आई हैव ऑलरेडी प्रिपेयर्ड अ समरी चार्ट इन योर बुक लेट्स रेफर इट फ्रॉम द समरी चार्ट येस एवरी वन यूर समरी ऑफ डिफरेंट टाइप ऑफ कमिटीज कैन यू सी दिस येस सो यू हैव गॉट योर ऑडिट कमिटी नॉमिनेशन एंड रेमिनरेशन कमिटीज स्टेक होल्डर्स रिलेशनशिप कमिटी एंड लास्ट वन इज योर रिस्क मैनेजमेंट कमिटी फॉर द फर्स्ट थ्री कमिटीज the first three committees are mandatory for every listed entity okay it is mandatory for every listed entity but when we talk about the risk management committee risk management committee is to be compulsorily uh, be formed by top 1000 listed entities it is not applicable for every listed entity it is applicable only to the top 1000 listed entities on the basis of market capitalization okay so first three are mandatory and then you have got what number of members should be there in the audit committee uh, nrc src and rmc so in all in all there should be at least three members okay at least three members sitting in this particular committee and in most of it and in most of it proportion of independent directors is the most because because we need independence we are going to take important decisions in this particular committees so in audit committee and nrc at least two third of them should be independent directors in, uh, should be independent directors and in src and nrc at src and rmc at least one of them should be independent director yes and for the first two where at least two third of them were independent directors chairperson of this committee chairperson of this committee should also be an independent director for uh, stakeholders relationship committee that person can be any non executive director and for rmc it can be it should be a member of the board because in rmc you can have members out of the board also sitting in the risk management committee the work of risk management committee is to identify the factors which can cause risk to the entity and to prepare a plan to avoid those risks so you can have some experts also from the outside right so one member from the board should be the chairperson of this particular committee yes audit committee meetings how many meetings should be conducted at least four maximum gap of 120 days for nrc and src at least one one meetings and for rmc at least two meetings should be conducted yes quorum quorum for first second and last one is almost similar for first and second it is two or one third whichever is higher two members or one third of the members sitting in this particular committee whichever is higher in audit committee we need at least two independent directors present in the quorum in nrc we need at least one independent director present and here we need at least one member from the board present because here we can have outsiders also and for src they haven't specified the quorum so the committee can decide what is what should be the what should ideally be the quorum for this particular committee meetings i hope you are very very clear till here everyone yes so this was your type of committees uh audit committee audit committee the main purpose of formulating here is what is the main purpose uh, to appoint the auditors to decide the remuneration of the auditors to decide the scope of work which is to be done by the auditors to address the grievances or the complaints raised by the auditors and for some other uh, specified purposes nomination and remuneration committee purpose of establishing this particular committee is to choose the directors to uh, you know determine their amount of remuneration to identify their performances to give them an increase to give them an increase in the pay on the basis of their performance to frame a policy for the directors of the company etc that work is done by the nrc now what is the work of the src the work of src is to address all the grievances raised by all the security holders all the security holders not the stakeholders of all the security holders and risk management committee we have already discussed the main work of this risk management committee is going to be to identify the factors internal factors external factors which can pose risk to our entity to our company and to prepare risk uh, fighting plans and to implement it. i hope i am very very clear till here yes going on to the other part now everyone here yes acha and one thing very very important is rmc was not applicable for all the listed entities it was applicable to the top 1000 listed entities top 1000 listed entities yes now one important thing that we have to do here is regulation number 1717 okay regulation number 17 Let's try to do that. 
स्टार मार्क दिस रेगुलेशन नंबर सेवेंटीन नाउ रेगुलेशन नंबर सेवेंटीन टॉक्स अबाउट अ पर्टिकुलर मिक्स ओके अ पर्टिकुलर ऑप्टिमम कॉम्बिनेशन ऑफ एग्जीक्यूटिव डिरेक्टर्स एंड नॉन एग्जीक्यूटिव डिरेक्टर्स सो दे से दैट नाउ सिंस वी आर टॉकिंग अबाउट एवरी लिस्टेड एंटिटी एवरी लिस्टेड एंटिटी शुड हैव एटलीस्ट वन वुमेन डिरेक्टर एंड देन दे से दैट एटलीस्ट Fifty percent of the total directors should be comprising of non-executive directors because we want independence. So at least fifty percent of them should be non-executive directors. Balance of them can be executive directors, right? And uh, suppose, suppose now if the chairperson. Now let's talk about the composition of independent director. Okay, uh, suppose if the chairperson of your uh, board of directors is a non-executive director. means it is a good position chairperson is a non executive director then at least at least one third of the board of directors should be independent directors at least one third should be independent directors but if chairperson is an executive director okay when the chairperson is an executive person then in that case at least half of them should be independent directors if chairperson is ned means he is independent so one third of the board can be independent directors but if he is not a ned then at least half of them should be independent director very clear with this acha what if what if chair person is a ned but he was a ex promoter or he was related to the promoters of the company etc by status he is ned but he becomes related to the most important people in the organization so he will be considered to be executive uh, chair person and if he is considered as an executive chair person then what should be the composition of independent directors in the board of the directors it should be at least 50% very clear with this yes did you understand the logic behind this chalo then going ahead to the last uh, two regulations regulation number 17a and regulation number 26 let's discuss it yes here it is regulation number 17a talks about maximum number of directorship means a particular person a particular person can be a director in how many listed entities okay for this particular purpose you have already studied in your companies act also that a person can be appointed as a director in 20 entities 20 companies out of that maximum 10 public companies he can hold directorship and the rest can be your private entity okay now here we are discussing that a person can be a director in how many listed entities so a person can be a director in maximum seven listed entities and he can also be appointed if he is holding the position of independent director means a person can be appointed as an independent directors in maximum seven listed it's not seven plus seven a huh? normal director in seven entities or independent directors in maximum seven entities seven listed entities okay but if there is a particular person who is already appointed as a whole time director or a managing director in any listed entity means he is already holding the key position in the company so he can act as an independent director in maximum three listed entities instead of seven listed entities okay so seven normal directorship seven independent directorship okay no problem okay but if he is already holding a position of md or wtd in a listed entity he can be appointed as a id in only three listed entities less the number of positions more will be the concentration that is the logic behind it this was given this was given in regulation number 17a okay this was given in regulation number 17a now let's go to the last regulation that is regulation number 26 regulation number 26 puts a restriction on us that you can become a committee member you as a director in how many committees can you be appointed as a member or in how many committees can you become a chairperson okay so a particular director can become a member of maximum 10 committees across all the companies i can become a member in maximum 10 committees across all the companies okay and i can become a chairperson in maximum five committees across all the companies members 10 chairperson 5 okay and only two committees are considered for this purpose one is audit committee and the other one is src for other nrc rmc etc there is no limit so this 10 and 5 limit we just have to check for two committees that is audit committee and the src i hope i am very very clear till your everyone yes these were these were your a most important provisions for the sebi lodr chapter yes 
Okay, so let's start with a super quick revision of the FEMA Act 1999. Uh, first of all, the Act applies to whom? The Act applies to whole of India again, uh, as were uh, as was applicable for all the other Acts also. Plus, it is also applicable to all the branches, to all the offices which are uh, outside India and which are controlled, owned or controlled by a person resident in India, right? Now, uh, in this particular law. First thing that we are supposed to do and we are going to do is the definitions part. In definitions, first two definitions, let's consider two definitions first. One is capital account transactions and the other one is your current account transactions. For the purpose of your capital account transaction, let's try to understand the definition. You all remember the definition, try to recollect it with me. Capital account transactions means any uh, transaction which alters the assets or liabilities including contingent liabilities of a PRI which is situated outside India or it includes all the any transaction which alters the assets or liabilities of a PROI okay such assets or liabilities which are situated here in India any such transaction which is altering such assets or liability such a transaction will be called as a capital account transaction and any transactions any transactions which are other than capital account transactions those transactions will be called as your current account transactions right examples of current account transactions can be payment in uh, uh, in the course of foreign trade import payments export payments received paid etc then uh, loan transaction will be considered as a capital account transaction but interest on loan will be considered as the current account transaction similarly income from investments will be considered as your current account transaction any amount that you are sending outside india for uh, you know for meeting some living expenses medical treatment expenses etc those will also be considered as your current account transactions so first we have to we need to learn first we need to learn and first we need to understand the definition of the term called as capital account transactions that you have to quote mandatorily in your exam whenever you're getting a relevant question and suppose if they are asking you your current account transactions then first quote the definition of uh, capital account transactions and then uh, right there any transactions other than the capital account transactions will be considered as your current account transaction very very clear with this Yes, in your textbook, we have got certain examples there. You can just refer it once after reading the definition part. Then going on to the next important definition, that is definition of PRI, person resident in India or person resident outside India. Okay, person resident in India or person resident outside India. Let's try to understand it. First, let's do it for the individual people. Okay, it uh, person resident in India means any person who is residing in India for more than or who has resided in India for more than 182 days. For more than 182 days during the preceding financial year means he has fulfilled the basic condition of being a PRI and that's why the person can be called as a PRI. What did I say? If he has stayed in India for a period of more than 182 days in the preceding financial year okay but if there is any person who has gone outside india or any person who stays outside india for three reasons either for employment outside india or for carrying on business or vocation outside india or for any other purpose or any other purpose where his uh, purpose uh, or the period uh, when he's going to come back to india is totally uncertain okay so for employment outside India, business or vocation outside India or for any other purpose outside India if that person has gone, then there is an inherent assumption that he is going to stay outside India for a longer period. That's why he will be excluded. Okay, he will be excluded from the term called as PRI. Okay, he will be excluded from the term called as PRI. Therefore, he will be called as the PROI. And similarly, any person who is coming to India Okay, any person who is coming to India for any of those three reasons. Okay, any person who is coming to India for any of those three reasons, either for business or for uh, employment in India or for any uncertain period. Okay, then in such a case, that person is going to stay in India for a longer period. That's why that person will be included in the definition of the person called as PRI. So, if you're going outside India for a longer period, exclude that person from PRI. But if that person is coming to India for a longer period, that is any of these three reasons, then that person will be included in the term called as PRI. Very, very clear with this. This is for PRI individual thing. 
ओके सो नाउ फॉर पर्सन अदर दैन इंडिविजुअल लेट्स ट्राई टू अंडरस्टैंड वेन विल अ पर्सन बी कंसिडर्ड एज अ पी आर आई सो वेन वी टॉक अबाउट कंपनीज एनी पर्सन और एनी बॉडी कॉर्पोरेट विच इज रजिस्टर्ड इन इंडिया और विच इज इन कॉर्पोरेटेड इन इंडिया दैट विल बी कंसिडर्ड एज अ पी आर आई देन आफ्टर दैट एनी ब्रांच और एनी ऑफिस विच इज सिचुएटेड यर इन इंडिया विच इज सिचुएटेड यर इन इंडिया and controlled by a PROI, even that will be considered as a PRI just because the fact that it is situated here in India. Okay. Similarly, any branch, office, etc., which is situated outside India, but which is controlled or which is owned by a PRI. Since here, since the control is by the PRI, wherever you get an Indian connection here, they say that that person will be considered as a PRI. I hope I am very very clear till here. Yes, so individuals we check the number of days stay, and after that we check the purpose. For what purpose a particular person is coming in India, or for what purpose a person is going outside India. After that, for persons other than individuals, for company we will always say that Indian company will always be considered to be a PRI. But if there is any branch which is controlled or owned by a PROI, but which is situated here in India. will also be considered as a pri or which is situated outside india but controlled or owned by a pri will also be considered as a pri right all these people all these people were coming under the definition of the term pri and any person who is not a pri okay any person who is not a pri will be considered as a proi okay any person who is not a pri will be considered as a proi i hope i am very very clear till here yes so we are done with the current account transactions capital account transaction definition of pri and definition of proi just like we had the examples on current account and capital account transaction same way we have got the examples of uh, um, this pri and proi we have it for current account and capital account also and we have it for pri and proi also in your textbook yes now uh, similarly you have got uh, a few sections here before we jump to the main part of the chapter you have got two sections uh, coming up here one is your section number 3 and the other one is your section number 4 section number 3 mainly talks about regulation and management of foreign exchange dealing in of management of foreign exchange in that let's talk about section number 3 section number 3 basically con uh, contains four points within it first one Uh, if there is any particular person other than an authorized person means other than a bank dealer etc that person like people like you and me we cannot deal into foreign forex or foreign security but we can do it through an authorized dealer we can do it through a money changer but we cannot directly deal we cannot directly trade into dollars for example here okay similarly we cannot do any payment on behalf of a proi person here in india suppose if a proi is supposed to do some transaction here in india we cannot do the payment on his behalf okay next one similarly uh, say for example i am running some business and if i want to receive some fees or if i want to receive some payment here then in that case i cannot do it in foreign currency directly okay i can accept inr but i cannot directly accept the foreign currency and next one next one is i should not enter into any such type of financial transactions for example hawala transactions okay that is totally prohibited all these things are given under section number 3 and now they are talking about section number 4 section number 4 talks about holding of forex they say that by default a pri by default a, a pri should not acquire should not hold should not own should not transfer any forex or foreign security except as per the method provided into the act means by default we cannot deal into forex but you can deal in the methods or in the manner which is provided into the act very very clear with this yes so ma'am how much forex can we hold etc we have those provisions as per section 4 you cannot do it except as per the act then ma'am what amount does the act specify we will come to the same yes now going on to the next most important part of the chapter that is section number 5 which talks about your current account transactions okay now they are telling current account transaction definition we have already done now first of all they are telling that whenever we are entering into any current account transactions there will be a few transactions which are totally prohibited 
there will be few current account transactions for which we require the prior approval of the central government and then there will be a few transactions for which we require the prior approval of the RBI. Let's try to understand that and let's try to remember that for exam point of view. Okay. Now, first of all, they are telling that if you are doing any transactions which are specified in Schedule 1, we will see Schedule 1 transactions, those transactions are altogether prohibited and any transaction with a person resident in Nepal or Bhutan or any travel transaction to Nepal or Bhutan in foreign currency, in foreign currency is totally prohibited because, because Indian rupees work there. Okay, so no need to spend foreign currency for such country. Very, very clear with this. Yes, now Schedule 1 transaction. Let's try to understand which transactions are covered in Schedule 1. Okay, Schedule 1 has got 8 transactions which are totally prohibited. Okay, 8 transactions which are totally prohibited. Example, if you are, try to recollect, you have already studied, now you just have to remember. Now, any remittance out of lottery winnings, any remittance out of any other casual income like income from racing, riding or any other hobby, then remittance for purchase of lottery tickets, okay, remittance for purchase of lottery tickets, band, magazines, football pools, etc., which are specifically prohibited as per the government, okay, then if you want to make the payment of export commission, uh, for such a transaction where there is a barter transaction towards equity investment in joint venture or wholly owned subsidiary means we have um, we have done investment we have done investment and um, uh, for that particular purpose we have got stake from in the other company for that we have not paid the money but we have exported the goods so export commission on those goods is totally prohibited Similarly, export commission in case of rupee state credit route uh, is totally prohibited. But in that case, tea and tobacco, tea and tobacco, if whenever you have exported, you can pay export commission on that up to 10% of the invoice value. Uh, up to 10% of invoice value and export of tea and tobacco is okay. Otherwise, any export commission under rupee state credit route is altogether prohibited. Then payment of dividend, payment of dividend under dividend balancing system is totally prohibited prohibited callback services for telephone is prohibited and any remittance of uh, interest income which we have earned out of non-resident special rupee scheme account from that if you are remitting any amount of interest from this particular amount that cannot be remitted outside India that has to be utilized here in India only so these are certain specific transactions which were all together which were all together prohibited uh, 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 these current account transactions are altogether prohibited and all these transactions are mentioned in Schedule 1. Okay, so Schedule 1 plus Nepal-Bhutan transactions are altogether prohibited. Right, now going on to the next schedule that is Schedule number 2 which talks about uh, transactions which have been listed here which requires prior approval of Central Government of India. Okay, prior approval of Central Government of India from respective ministries and from respective departments, we have to take the necessary approvals. For this, uh, you already have the story code made in your textbook. That is, uh, total we are going to have nine pointers. Okay, total we are going to have nine pointers coming up here. Let's try to uh, uh, recollect the story and put in those nine pointers. So, first of all, I wanted to go for a cultural tour. Right? I'll just show you the pointers here. I wanted to go for a cultural tour for which I saw an advertisement. Since the traveling was very costly, so I decided to go by a freight vessel. Uh, for that purpose, I contacted an ocean transport agent. Ocean transport agent. And uh, he allowed me to go for by, the, by way of freight vessel. Then while going, our container got detained. Our container got detained. And so to safeguard myself, I started sending signals by transponders. Then someone came for my help and asked for prize money. Someone asked for prize money and I paid it for my protection. Okay, so these are the type of transactions for which if you want to do any remittances outside India, you need to take the prior approval of Central Government of India from the respective ministries which are written here. Okay, besides, besides every particular transaction, the name of the ministries are given. Yes.
so schedule 2 transactions are not prohibited transaction schedule 2 transactions can be done subject to prior approval subject to prior approval from the central government right and then the next one that is schedule 3 okay schedule 3 transaction transact schedule 3 transactions contains all the transactions which require prior approval from the rbi okay but for that what they have done is first of all the government has introduced something called as liberalized remittance scheme where we can remit outside india up to 2 lakh 50 thousand us dollars without any approvals okay up to 2 lakh 50 thousand us dollars without any approvals very clear with this okay if the amount exceeds 2 lakh 50 thousand usd then we are required to take the prior approval of rbi so ma'am for which all things will be for like which all things will be covered in schedule 3 basically any such type of remittances which were not covered in schedule 1 and schedule 2 will be covered in schedule 3 example example if you are going for travel to any other country except nepal and bhutan okay then if you want to incur some medical treatment expenses outside india if you want to incur some education expenses outside india if you want to send some gift outside india or if you are incurring any emigration expenses for permanently settling outside india if i am maintaining one of my relatives outside india or if there is a business travel or if there is a conference exhibition kind of a thing outside india or any other current account transaction which are not specified in schedule 1 and schedule 2 very very clear with this for these transactions only if the amount exceeds 2 lakh 50 thousand usd in a particular financial year then only approval from the rbi is required okay and specifically for medical treatment for education expenses and for emigration for these three even if it exceeds 2 lakh 50 thousand usd you need not take the prior approval from the rbi only for these three are medical education and emigration I hope I am very very clear till here everyone. Yes and this LRS benefit is available for individuals also and this LRS benefit is available for other than individuals also. It is available, it was mainly introduced for current account transaction but it can even be utilized for your capital account transactions. I hope I am very very clear till here. Yes. Okay. Then going on to other part of the schedule 3 that is for uh, uh, your current account transactions for other than individuals. Okay, current account transactions for other than individuals. For them they have given four points specifically. First one is some specific donations. Then commissions. If we have paid any commission for sale of residential flats or commercial plots in India means the property has been sold here in India but we have paid the commissions to agents abroad because they have helped us in selling the property here in India or for remittances outside India for infrastructure projects and for other consultancy projects for other uh, cases and if we have remitted any amount outside India as reimbursement of pre-incorporation expenses means someone from outside India had earlier borne the pre-incorporation expenses of any company here in India but now we have reimbursed that amount. So can we see in all the cases the money is going outside India right if the amount is going uh, beyond this limit then we have to take the prior approval of RBI. Example for donation if you are, you are donating the amount in foreign currency and if the amount of donation is a more than 1% of the total foreign exchange earnings during the last 3 years or 50 lakh US dollars whichever is lower. 1% of the forex exchange earnings of the last 3 years or 50 lakh US dollars whichever is lower. If more than this, if more than this is remitted then you have to take the prior approval of RBI. Okay, similarly commission to agents abroad. If uh, 25,000 US dollars or 5% of the sale consideration whichever is higher. If more than this commission is remitted outside India. Okay, if more than this uh, commission is remitted outside India, then prior approval of RBI is required. Okay, similarly, for infrastructure projects, if you have paid any consultancy charges exceeding 1 crore USD, then take the prior approval of RBI. For other projects, it is 10 lakh US dollars, then take the prior approval of RBI. And for uh, reimbursement of pre-incorporation expenses, 5% of the investment that that person had brought into India, that amount, 
or 1 lakh USD whichever is higher. If you are remitting more than this limit then take the prior approval of RBI. Otherwise you can do the transaction even without taking the prior approval of RBI. I hope I am very very clear till here everyone. Yes. Okay. Then let's go to the next part. Uh, the next one is your capital account transaction. Let's try to uh, recollect the most important provisions for your capital account transactions. Yes. Now, capital account transactions definitions so we have already done. Yes. Now, they are telling us here is RBI can after consulting with the central government, it can decide which type of capital account transactions will be permissible. If it is not per, if like which are totally freely permissible, which are permissible up to a certain limit, which transactions will require the approval from the government etc. This will be decided by the RBI after consultation with the central government. Okay. Similarly, similarly, say for example, if there was a, a PROI who had some property outside India and now he becomes a PRI, can he still hold that property? Answer is yes. Can he acquire some property by way of inheritance from outside India? Yes, he can acquire. Okay, and vice versa also. Suppose if today I am a PRI here, I am having some property here in India and I want to become a PROI or my status is going to change to PROI. Can I still hold the Indian property? Answer is yes. Can I acquire any property by way of inheritance? Answer is yes. No problem in that. Okay, all these things are given in section number 6. Yes, now let's try to understand which transactions are permitted, which transactions are not permitted. Let's try to understand uh, just like we had for current account transaction, schedule 1, schedule 2 etc. Let's try to understand it for this also. Now, for capital account transactions, it will be splitted into two categories first of all. Okay, now in this schedule 1 talks about all the permissible transactions all the permissible transactions which can be done by a PRI okay and schedule 2 contains all the permissible transactions which can be done by a PROI okay all the capital account transactions are basically classified into two one the transactions which are done by a PRI example I am transferring some immovable property outside India I am borrowing some amount from a PROI etc these transactions are done by whom these transactions are done by a PRI so these will be falling under schedule 1 okay till now we haven't decided whether these are allowed or these are not allowed we are just classifying the transactions that is schedule 1 schedule 2 schedule 1 will be those which are done by a pri schedule 2 will be those which are done by a proi okay please don't by heart the list given here just try to remember that schedule 1 contains all the transactions which are done by capital account transactions done by pri and schedule 2 P, uh, capital account transactions done by a proi very very clear with this Yes, Acha. now similarly, similarly, further they have divided these transactions into three categories. Uh, first one is transactions with no restrictions. Okay, only two transactions are coming up here which can be done without any restrictions. Then five transactions which are altogether prohibited. Just like for current account transactions also we had some transactions which are prohibited, right? Similarly, five capital account transactions which are totally prohibited and for all the other transactions which are not falling in these two categories, those can be done but subjected to the regulations. Okay, transactions can be done subjected to the regulations. I hope I am very very clear till here everyone. Yes, okay. Now, let's try to understand which transactions can be done with no, re no restrictions. First of all, repayment of any loan. <clears throat> that is nothing but amortization of loan. That can be done without any restrictions. No problem in that. Okay. Similarly, similarly, suppose if there is some depreciation in direct investments which are done in ordinary course of business in some other country. Means you have invested some amount in the other country and where a minimum amount of investment was supposed to be maintained. And now your investment has gone below that limit. So to maintain, to come back to that particular limit, if you are doing some additional investment, for that also there is no restriction. Okay, for that if there is no restriction, for that if there is no restriction, then in such a case, then in such a case, uh, you need not take any approvals from the RPI or the central. 
okay so two transaction first one uh, for amortization of loan that is repayment of loan and second one is for depreciation in direct investments done in ordinary course of business i have given the example also yes Achha. then five transactions which are totally prohibited for a proi okay proi if he is doing any of these five transactions here in india it is totally prohibited for him now what what what, uh, what are prohibited which transactions are prohibited proi doing investments in chit fund business in agriculture or plantation activities in real estate business or construction of farm houses specifically farm houses if they are doing investment in nidhi company or if they are trading in the tdrs okay these five chit fund nidhi company agriculture plantation real estate or construction of farm houses and trading in tdrs these five sectors they are telling that no entry for a proi these will be specifically handled by the pri only yes and any transactions apart from these two plus five transaction okay apart from these two plus five transactions those transactions will be subjected to the regulations means for which the rbi is going to give regulations that how to enter into those transactions whether those are permissible whether those are not permissible etc i hope i am very very clear till here yes now now let's go let's uh, try to understand uh, you remember i had told you that 250000 usd limit can be used for capital account transactions also for individuals yes so here it is that 250000 usd that was applicable for if you are doing it for current account transaction that can be used for used by individuals also and persons other than individuals also but when individuals are utilizing individuals can utilize it for capital account transactions also plus your current account transactions also yes okay then let's go to the next important part of the chapter that is your export provisions now they are telling that uh, export yes export is favorable for the country but export will be favorable for the country only if we are receiving the sale proceeds on time right so whenever any exporter is exporting the goods he is required to furnish to the rbi and to the respective authorities a declaration a declaration which contains all the details about the goods exported and uh, how much amount of uh, consideration will be realized from the other country and uh, rbi can direct that exporter to comply with certain requirements to ensure that we receive the export proceeds on time okay so declaration is going to contain mainly all the details about the goods exported and how much amount is going to be repatriated or how much amount is going to be realized from that other country okay in some cases declaration is not required okay example whenever we are exporting some goods for free example trade samples or if we are exporting something for advertisement we are when we are exporting our goods our personal goods to the other country at that time the declaration is not required okay whenever uh, we are sending some goods to the other country for repairs suppose if we have we had imported and now we are sending it for uh, repairs outside india means basically where there is no consideration involved for those cases the declaration is not required okay and one important point to be remembered here is whenever we are exporting goods and if the value of exports does, value of goods does not exceed rupees 5 lakhs then you just give a self declaration that the value does not exceed rupees 5 lakhs so we have not submitted the declaration but if the gift gift value is more than rupees 5 lakhs then declaration is going to be required okay ma'am this declaration will be submitted by whom and to whom so this declaration for goods and services for goods and services it is going to be in form edf which stands for export declaration form which will be submitted in duplicate to the commissioner of customs and commissioner after verifying it he will forward the original one to the nearest rbi office and the duplicate copy will be given to the exporter back so that the exporter can submit it to the authorized dealer authorized dealer means our banker through whom the export proceeds will be realized okay and in case whenever we are exporting software then in that case your declaration will be called as form softex which will be submitted in triplicate to the official of ministry of it okay ministry of it will forward the original one to the nearest office of rbi duplicate copy will be given to the exporter so that the exporter can give it to the 
uh, authorized dealer and the third copy will be retained by that ministry of IT only. Okay, so this is basically a procedural part that they have given here. The main purpose, the main purpose of this declaration thing is respective authority should know that what value of goods have been exported and how much amount are we going to receive from the other country. Okay, now normally whenever we are exporting the goods, software, services, within how much time, within how much time the money should be realized? Okay, within how much time the money should be realized? Whenever you are repatriating, whenever you are sending the goods outside India, normally the money should come into India within a time period of 9 months from the date of export. Okay, or any other extended time period as given by the RBI, but normally 9 months. But whenever you are exporting the goods to the warehouse, means you are going to store the goods there and then you are going to sell it. Then in such cases, the money should be realized within a time period of 15 months from the date of shipment or any extended time period as given by the RBI. Very, very clear with this. Yes, Achha, whenever you are exporting the goods to SCZ etc also doesn't matter, it is going to fall under 9 months only. Only when warehouse comes into picture, then 15 months time period is applicable. Very, very clear with this. Achha, now, can there be a delay in receipt of payment beyond the specified period? Answer is yes. Then in that case, RBI will come into picture. It will give the directions what is supposed to be done. Either call for the payment for, from the other country or if or if those goods which you had exported, those are kept unsold, then you can re-import those goods back into our country. Very, very clear with this. Yes. Achha, to avoid all these problems, there was also a concept for advance payment against export. Means first call for the payment and then export the goods. Even this works, even this works. But in that case, whenever you receive the money first, then make sure that you complete the shipment of goods within one year from the date of receipt of payment. Achha, but what if the ex agreement provides for a period beyond one year? Then period beyond one year will be applicable. Otherwise, shipment of goods should be done within a time period of one year. If it is not done, if it is not done and if RBI directs, then we will be liable to pay interest at maximum LIBOR plus 100 basis points interest rate. Okay, And once you have exported the goods, after that, submit the documents of export to the same authorized dealer through whom you had received the advance payment so that the transaction can be squared off. Yes. Okay. So this was mainly talking about your important provisions from exports. Okay. Now listen, how much amount can we hold as Forex? We had studied somewhere in section number four, we cannot own, hold Forex, etc. except as per the act. So they say that foreign coins Okay, foreign currency coins, coins you can hold without any limit, there is no limit on that and in form of currency notes, bank notes, travelers check, you can hold maximum up to 2000 USD at any point of time. Okay, this is the limit that has been given to us under the FEMA. I hope you are very very clear till here. Yes, then going on to the procedural part and other provisions from the chapter. <clears throat> Can we go ahead? Yes, okay. So now uh, let's uh, start with the other parts. Now, first of all, there is a person called as authorized person here under FEMA. Now, this authorized person includes your authorized dealer, bankers, money changer, banking unit, offshore banking units, etc. who are allowed by the RBI to deal into Forex, to deal into foreign securities, etc. And once they get the certification from the RBI, after that, they will be called as the authorized person. Okay, now their authorization can be revoked. Okay, their authorization can be revoked if RBI is satisfied that they are going against the public interest or authorized person has failed to comply with certain conditions, certain provisions, etc. Then after giving a reasonable opportunity of being heard, their authorization can be cancelled. Okay, now since these people are coming under the purview of RBI, then RBI has got the power. Okay, RBI has got the power to issue directions 
to these authorized persons okay that how the payments are to be done on behalf of the clients how uh, uh, are they also they will also be required to submit the uh, furnish information from time to time to the rbi on behalf of the clients etc for that purpose rbi can direct these authorized persons to comply with their directions okay what if uh, now can can rbi also inspect such people yes since these people are coming under the purview of rbi inspection can be done now say for example if rbi had asked for certain information and rbi now wants to check whether correct information was submitted by them or not that is one thing okay or if such per, uh, such authorized person has failed to furnish some information then rbi can inspect such authorized person or if the authorized person is not complying with certain provisions then also the rbi can ask uh, can do the inspection of such authorized persons yes and it is the responsibility of the authorized person it of its officers managers etc to to cooperate and to provide the necessary information very very clear with this yes okay now similarly uh, suppose if these people are uh, not complying authorized person is not complying with any directions given by the rbi or they fail to file any returns etc as told by the rbi then they will be liable for a penalty up to rupees 10000 and in case of continuing offense means even after giving warning they are still continuing it then additional penalty up to rupees 2000 per day okay additional penalty up to rupees 2000 per day will be applicable up to uh, both places it is up to maximum i hope i am very very clear till here okay now let's do the other penalties contraventions for other people okay now suppose if there is contravention of any provisions of the fema act fema rules fema regulations etc and if the amount of default is quantifiable then the amount of penalty applicable will be three times the amount involved in that particular contravention and if that default is not quantifiable then up to rupees 2 lakhs then penalty can be applicable on such person up to rupees 2 lakhs and in either of the cases if it is continuing even beyond then there can be a further penalty up to rupees 5000 per day okay so if quantifiable then the three times the amount involved in the offense if not quantifiable then up to rupees 2 lakhs and in case of continuing one then up to rupees 5000 per day and if we fail to pay this penalty okay if we fail to pay this penalty then there can be we are supposed to pay it within a time period of 90 days okay that is given in section number 14 we are supposed to pay this penalty within a time period of 90 days from date of receipt of notice and if we fail to make that payment then there can be an imprisonment suppose if the amount of penalty is up to 1 crore amount of penalty is up to rupees 1 crore then imprisonment can be there up to 6 months if it is more than rupees 1 crore then it can be there up to 3 years very very clear with this yes but for imprisonment can we say that we'll have to first arrest that person so arrest can be done only after a show cause notice was issued to that defaulting person yes okay Achha, but in some cases it can so happen that that person is trying to abscond india is trying to run away from india then we can even arrest that person without issuing him the show cause notice because that is required in the interest of the government yes now suppose if suppose if uh, we are of the if suppose if the person who has been levied with this penalty that person uh, can go and also make an application to the enforcement directorate to the ed that sir please compound our offense that is please reduce please reduce the amount of penalty punishment on me then in that case whenever we go and make an application within a time period of 180 days enforcement directorate may do the compounding okay and if compounding is done then no further procedures can be uh, initiated against that particular person yes Achha. who will do the adjudication of penalty etc here just like your sebi here also the adjudication will be done by an authority called as adjudicating authority so as soon as the adjudicating authority comes to know of any non-compliances it will calculate the amount of penalty yes now and once the amount of penalty is calculated then penalty will be imposed and we are required to pay the penalty within a time period of 90 days okay as soon as we receive the penalty order after that after that we can even go if we it is not mandatory but we may go for compounding and if our application is accepted compounding can be done within a time period of 180 days 
yes suppose if we are not happy suppose if we are not happy with the order passed by the adjudicating authority then we can go for appeals first level of appeal is special director second level of appeal is appellate tribunal and the third level of appeal is going to be your high court we can go to the special director of appeals within a time period of 45 days from the aa's order okay then then if we are still aggrieved by the order passed by the special director of appeal then we can go to the appellate tribunal within 45 days of receipt of the uh, special director's order and appellate tribunal will try to dispose it of within a time period of 180 days and then if we are again aggrieved by the order of the appellate tribunal then we can go and file an appeal before the high court but only on question of lawyer only on question of law within 60 days plus the delay can be condoned by a further period of 60 days i hope i am very very clear till here yes then there is an inherent assumption of the law that whatever whatever books documents etc has been found in your premises and if it contains someone's handwriting signature etc then it is deemed that it belongs to you okay unless proved otherwise if you prove it to the contrary then that's a different different case but otherwise whatever is found in your premises belongs to you only okay now in this entire fema chapter the main work is done by the rbi right main work is done by the rbi and above rbi you have got the central government so central government will issue the directions to the rbi rbi will give it to the authorized persons and that's how the uh, sequence flows there okay then there is a common provision coming up here that is contravention by companies in case of contravention by companies who will be held guilty the person in charge will be held guilty but he won't be held guilty if he proves that it was done without his knowledge and he had exercised due diligence to prevent the sale. In case of death or insolvency, the case is not going to lapse. It is going to continue against the legal hire in case of death and in case of insolvency, it will be continued against the official assignee or the official receiver. I hope I am very very clear till here everyone. Yes and after this, after this you have got three provisions as you already know one is your import provisions okay next one is your uh, overseas direct investment provisions which was newly amended for the may 23 examinations and then you have got the ecb provisions for your uh, overseas direct investments new regulations 2022 were introduced for which i have specifically put a video on youtube for which i'll be sharing a link in the description also and uh, for import and ecb already an old video was there on your youtube for that also i will be sharing a link yes and with this with this your fema chapter with this your fema chapter comes to an end Yes, I hope you are able, you were able to revise all the important provisions.